come in the night and strike without warning. Targeting tombs and palaces, these robbers of the dead have been plundering riches since the beginning of time. This tomb was probably robbed by people who helped build it. Follow the trail of the Tomb Raiders as we crawl through the hidden passages buried deep within Egypt's massive pyramids. Learn the smugglers' secrets and prowl the dark alleyways of the black market antiquities trade. Where'd you get these things from? Then ride along with antiquities police as they swoop down on suspected looters and find out if even these high-tech warriors can thwart the relentless Tomb Raiders. Tomb Raiders have been at work almost as long as man has been burying the dead. Some of the earliest evidence of the crime comes from Egypt where the ancient pyramids proved irresistible to thieves. The Egyptian tombs were a ripe target for tomb raiders because of the great wealth that was placed in them. The Egyptians really believed that you could take it with you, and so they would include all sorts of valuable items with the bodies. Ancient Egyptians decided to rob the tombs pretty much soon after they were built because they knew what was inside. So a lot of the people who had built the tombs or the priests who were supposed to be looking after the tombs, in fact, were the ones who robbed them. A noted expert on mummies, Dr. Salima Ikram has spent her career exploring the mysterious tombs of Egypt. As our personal tour guide, Dr. Ikram points out the startling evidence left behind by ancient tomb robbers in places like Medum. Located 50 miles south of Cairo, Medum is the first true pyramid ever attempted by ancient Egyptians. But it is the mastabas, or bench tombs surrounding the pyramid, that hold the greatest secrets. This is the robber's tunnel. It's a quite a tight squeeze. The robbers chisel down through the tafla and then in through the stone-built mastaba. Accessible only through the tunnel dug by ancient tomb robbers, few tourists visit the Medum mastaba. Okay. Many of the claustrophobic passages are so dark that special night vision cameras are required to film them. This tomb was probably robbed by people who helped build it. The tomb robbers knew exactly where to go. They broke in parallel to the main entrance of the tomb. This is where they should have come in. There's a big sloping passage, but it was not never used by the tomb robbers because the priests and other necropolis workers would have been looking after the front entrance. But if they snuck in from the back and knew exactly where to go, it would explain why they made it into the tomb chamber so efficiently. Descending deeper through the hot, suffocating tunnels, Dr. Ikram makes her way into the burial chamber. The fragments of limestone that are lying around the burial chamber are actually probably part of a big block that sealed the doorway. You can see where it's been gouged apart, where thieves broke in. This is a hammer. It's an ancient Egyptian hammer, and it was left here by tomb robbers who shoved aside the lid of the sarcophagus and then put the hammer there so it wouldn't come crashing down on their fingers while they rifled the tomb. Ever vigilant for snakes and scorpions, Dr. Akram slowly makes her way back to the surface through the robber's tunnel. There are lots of twists and turns to this whole experience. And when one looks out and you think, oh, thank God, at last there's light. Oh, it's quite a relief to get out of that twisty, turny tunnel that keeps going in. But thank God for the tomb robbers, because if they hadn't done that, it would be difficult for both visitors and archaeologists to visit the site. Documents found hidden in the vast temple complex of Medinet Habu, located 280 miles away in Luxor provide further evidence of tomb raiding in ancient Egypt, including the actual testimony of the tomb robbers themselves. These tomb robbers papyri, in fact, are the transcripts of a trial held. 
And so these are probably the first um, court reports that we have from any period in history. It, it is a bit ironic that tomb robbers were the ones who ultimately discovered the tomb robbery papyri. Uh, but fortunately, they seem to have taken reasonably good care of them, so they survived mostly intact and give us a really compelling story of the intrigues that took place in the Theban necropolis. A tomb raider named Amen Nufer recalls, we went to rob the tombs in accordance with our regular habit, and we found the pyramid of King Sebekemsaf. This being not at all like the pyramids and tombs of the nobles which we habitually went to rob. We took our copper tools and forced a way into the pyramid of this king through its innermost part. We found its underground chambers, and we took lighted candles in our hands and went down. Then we found this god lying at the back of his burial place, and we found the burial place of his queen situated beside him. We collected the gold we found on the noble mummy of this god, together with his amulets and jewels which were on his neck. We collected all that we found upon the queen's mummy likewise, and set fire to their coffins. Unfortunately, the section of papyri has been lost detailing the punishment that befell the convicted tomb robbers. But chances are, it was a gruesome one. The punishments inflicted on tomb raiders were severe. Uh, if you lied during an interrogation, your nose and ears would be cut off and you'd be sent to Nubia, presumably to work in the gold mines. Not very pleasant. But even worse, if you were convicted of tomb robbery, especially of violating a royal tomb, you would be impaled. The favorite, of course, was the death of five cuts. It consisted of cutting off the ears, the nose, pulling out the eyes, and then the mouth and the tongue of the individual. And finally, they might even be impaled, or else they'd wander the streets in this way. And so it was indeed one of the worst possible punishments that could be meted out to a tomb robber. In an attempt to protect the pharaoh's crypts, royal architects of Egypt's old kingdom began filling the pyramids with anti-Tomb Raider features. Excellent examples of these deterrents can still be seen in the ancient pyramids of the sprawling Saqqara necropolis, located 10 miles south of downtown Cairo. This is the entrance to the pyramid of King Teti I. He ruled in Egypt's sixth dynasty, and the pyramid was made about 4,500 years ago. The entrance is just here on the flat ground level. And above, you would expect to see a massive white pyramid sort of gleaming from the distance. Instead, what you really do see is a pile of basically rubbish. But Teti's pyramid didn't always look so bad. All the pyramids of Egypt would have actually been faced with fine limestone like this, so they would have been white sheets going straight up to the sky. However, the pyramid casing was all stolen, not even so long ago. This was stolen probably to burn for lime and then use in the construction of the modern city of Cairo. So all of this has been taken away, leaving only this pile of disorganized and disorderly stones, and um, the only real indication of a pyramid being the burial chamber below. This tunnel led to the burial chamber of the king, and um, it was lined in some places with red granite. The red granite was supposed to stop tomb raiders from getting into the tombs. Royal architects hoped that this hard stone lining would keep robbers from digging parallel tunnels for the soft limestone rubble core of the pyramid, and then breaking in from the side. The door of this antechamber would have been probably sealed with this piece of granite. So we have more granite sealing up all the doorways that went into the burial chamber. This, though, is where the ancient Egyptians tried to stop their robbers. This is a part of a portcullis. The portcullis works in a tomb just the way it does in a castle. It's a huge, thick slab of rock, and it's held up on top of the passage. And then finally, when it comes time to seal the tomb, the granite boulder comes crashing down 
This would prevent robbers from getting in because it was made out of a hard stone uh, that people couldn't chisel through very easily. This is another of these huge portcullises. There were three portcullises in this pyramid. Um, and here you can see up, there is a space where it would come crashing down from, sealing the tomb forever. Portcullises, however, were never intended to be booby traps. Hollywood movies, of course, always like to show traps and dangers. Think of Indiana Jones running through chambers with arrows shooting at him, big balls of stone running down. But archaeologists, when we excavate a tomb, we don't worry about those kinds of things because, so far as we know, the ancient Egyptians never used actual traps like this. But Dr. Ikram believes that the tomb of Teddy I may have been the source for one of the false rumors. The ceiling of the burial chamber is decorated with stars. But what's interesting here is you see that the ceiling has slumped in two or three places. This slumping is actually inadvertent, but perhaps this is what gave various other writers ideas that the ancient Egyptians had booby-trapped their tombs. And when you see movies, the idea is that part of the ceiling falls in and crushes tomb robbers or something else dramatic happens. But this is probably just due to an earthquake or some other kind of slippage. And here is the king's sarcophagus. This is where the king's body would be laid to rest in a wooden coffin. And in fact, there would be a mummy inside. Of course, now the mummy is gone. All that remains is just a list of these pyramid texts that would help protect the king. But obviously, they didn't protect him. Unfortunately, the king's tomb was badly robbed, which is why the sarcophagus is broken in, in this way. And the body and all the objects in the tomb were taken out. The pyramid builders tried everything, including mystical curses, to keep tomb robbers away. The Egyptians, in fact, believed in redundancy in terms of protecting things. So they would have these physical barriers, but also curses to uh, protect the body of the king and uh, attack looters. But sometimes these curses took a form that is very Egyptian and wouldn't really mean much to us today. Here we have one of the curses in the tomb of Hesse from the 6th dynasty. And it reads, basically, that I will judge anyone with the counsel of the great gods um, who comes into this tomb who has eaten of abominations or is in an impure state and will punish him appropriately. But some of the curses were actually a lot more practical. So one of them talks about wringing someone's neck like a goose. And uh, the other one would sick crocodiles and hippos and scorpions and all sorts of nasty critters on the person. Uh, so there were physical threats as well. The looters, however, the Tomb Raiders, don't seem to have been terribly worried about this. They just went through and looted the tombs anyhow. As tomb robberies continued unchecked, the safeguards became more and more elaborate with each succeeding pharaoh. In the Middle Kingdom, the builders of the pyramids realized that the Old Kingdom pyramids had already been robbed. So they decided to install all kinds of secret entrances, hidden ways, deep wells to catch tomb robbers, as well as a whole plethora of fake burial chambers, walls that, you know, suddenly you have a dead end into. So they tried a lot. Perhaps the best example of this trickery can be found near the fertile Al Fayum Oasis, 80 miles southwest of Cairo. There, the pyramid of Senusrit II employed deception to try to confound would be tomb raiders nearly 4,000 years ago. This is the pyramid of Senusrit II, who ruled in the 12th dynasty. He changed the way pyramids were built completely because on the north side, where you would generally expect the entrance, there is none. Instead of having his entrance on the north side of the pyramid as was normal, Sanusut II had his entrance on the south side. And he had, instead of just one entrance, he had a couple, one of which is here. And this one goes down for 25 meters straight down deep into the ground. And then it goes off for 50 meters straight horizontally before it meets up with a well. The well, no one's ever reached the bottom of it yet. It just goes down into a very deep shaft and it seems endless. Once you get past this deep well, the tomb continues on for several meters and it twists and turns until finally it winds up in the granite burial chamber. Even these elaborate precautions could not stop the tomb raiders. When the father of Egyptian archeology, span William Matthew Flinders Petrie, 
excavated the burial chamber in 1913. He was saddened to find it contained only a single uraeus, or golden cobra, and the leg bone of the pharaoh Senusrit II. But at least one trick used in the pyramid complex did work, helping to preserve the final resting place of the pharaoh's daughter. On the north side of the pyramid, which is highly unusual, were a series of eight mastaba tombs. And these mastabas were constructed out of mud brick, or so Petrie thought, because after he cleared away the mud brick, he found that instead they were built of solid stone, just the bedrock of this plateau. There were no passageways, there were no entries, there was nothing. And so it was a big mystery as to where the people who should have been buried here were buried. These false mastabas, or bench tombs, were meant to fool tomb robbers into believing that riches lay inside, when in fact, the princesses were buried on the opposite side of the pyramid. This is a shaft of one of the princesses' tombs at Lahoon. Many of the princesses seem to have had fake mastabas on the north side of the pyramid so that people would think they were actually buried there. But in reality, their burials were in the south side in deep shafts that were cut into the bedrock and then went off at steep angles further into the plateau. So no one could really find where their tombs were. And in fact, the tomb of Sit Hathor Yunit is one that has yielded a great deal of gold and jewelry and other treasures. So some of the finest jewelry we have from the Middle Kingdom comes from this tomb in Lahun. Unfortunately, even the most cunning design could not keep the greedy tomb raiders at bay forever. Because of the constant looting, the ancient Egyptians abandoned the use of pyramids as burial sites in favor of the more anonymous and hopefully more secure tombs hidden in the Valley of the Kings. But even this secret site was not foolproof. When archaeologist Howard Carter first discovered the grand tomb of King Tutankhamun in 1922, he found surprising evidence that ancient grave robbers had preceded him. Now that the whole door was exposed to light, it was possible to discern that there had been two successive openings and reclosings of a part of its surface. Plunderers had entered it and entered it more than once. Inside the tomb, Carter traced the destructive path left by the thieves including a set of ghostly footprints. One robber, there would probably not have been room for more than one, had crept into the chamber and had then hastily but systematically ransacked its entire contents, emptying boxes, throwing things aside, pulling them one upon another, and occasionally passing objects through the hole to his companions for closer examination in the outer chamber. He had done his work just about as thoroughly as an earthquake. Carter felt that the tomb had been robbed not long after the burial itself. There are a couple of lines of evidence for this. One is the fact that the looters went for these unguents, which would per be perishable otherwise. But another is that we know that some tombs were looted right around the same period. So it's very likely that the looting of Tutankhamun's tomb occurred right about at the same time. But perhaps the most surprising evidence Carter found led him to conclude that the Tomb Raiders did not get away with their crime. One of the boxes contained a handful of solid gold rings tied up in a fold of cloth. It was the very last thing that a thief would be likely to forget, and we are almost forced to the conclusion that the thieves were either trapped within the tomb or overtaken in their flight. If this be so, it explains the presence of certain pieces of jewelry and gold work, too valuable to leave and too big to overlook. And you can imagine if you close your eyes and you go back 3,000 years ago to the Valley of the Kings, and you can see thieves are walking slowly in the dark, opening tombs, and you can remember the tomb of King Tut when thieves entered inside and they heard the noise of the police cemetery. And when they heard their steps, they ran away and the police came and they sealed the tomb. 
when even the secret tombs in the Valley of the Kings proved vulnerable to tomb raiders, royal priests made one last desperate bid to protect the bodies of the pharaohs. The priesthood that were in charge of protecting the tombs realized that, in fact, there was no possible way to secure all of them. So they decided to start grouping the kings. And so the kings started moving around. It was kind of like a big game of musical chairs. Well, eventually, after shuffling these burials around, hither and thither and yon, the priest decided to select two tombs to have major caches in. The main cache of burials was at Dar al-Bahri, where they took a tomb that was probably designed for the priest kings of the 21st dynasty, and then placed a lot of the great luminaries of the New Kingdom in this tomb, including Ramses II, Tutmosis III, uh, some of the greatest pharaohs of all time. Amazingly, this hiding place remained secure for nearly 3,000 years before Chance revealed it once more. In the 19th century, wealthy visitors to Egypt were anxious to take home a souvenir of their trip. So they come here and they want a hand of a mummy, the leg of a mummy, perhaps an entire mummy, or scarabs, statues, and in fact, entire walls were taken back to Europe and the United States and kept in people's libraries as display items as a memento of their trip to ancient Egypt. But mummies weren't prized just for their aesthetic appeal. From the 12th century AD onward, doctors, both Arabian as well as European, had prescribed mummies for a variety of diseases. So you have mummy to be used for things like arthritis, other bone disease, as well as diseases of the blood. King Francis I of France, in fact, used to always carry a small pouch of mummy powder with him. He used to take it with rhubarb, um, and who knows which is worse, uh, mummy powder or rhubarb, but he believed that it would help staunch the blood in case he was ever attacked. To meet this demand for mummies, enterprising entrepreneurs plundered tombs all over Egypt. This was especially true for the area of Gurna, which is near Luxor. There, the tomb robbers had built their houses above the tombs. Tombs were cool and comfortable. They made great storage areas. You could keep things there if you didn't have a refrigerator. They also, of course, led sometimes to hidden treasure, which people could sell off to the tourists. So many of the families that lived in Gurna used to do this. And of course, the most notable of these was the Abdur Rasul family. In the mid 1800s, shepherd Abdel Rasul Ahmed stumbled upon a secret cave in the cliffs north of Deir al-Bari and quickly realized that he had found a gold mine, a tomb filled with priceless mummies. The Abdel Rasul family were very clever. Uh, rather than going into the Dar al-Bahri cache and stripping it of all its objects and dumping all these things on the antiquities market, which would immediately alert authorities, not to mention probably devalue the objects, they in fact mined the site for individual objects, which they would then sell on the antiquities market piece by piece and spread it out over a number of years. Their trade spread throughout the world. Around 1860, a Niagara Falls Museum owner named Thomas Barnett purchased a mummy, reportedly from the Abdel Rasul family's secret cache. The Niagara Falls mummy seems to be related to the Abdel Rasul family as well. The person that they used to handle their artifacts, in fact, sold many objects to the man who bought the Niagara Falls mummy as well as other mummies in his collection. For many years, the Abdel Rasuls ran a thriving business until Gaston Maspero, the head of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization, discovered their secret in 1881. The Arabs had disinterred a whole vault of pharaohs. And what pharaohs? Perhaps the most illustrious in the history of Egypt, Thutmose III and Seti I, Amos the Liberateur and Ramses II the Conqueror. I still wonder if I am not dreaming when I see and touch what were the bodies of so many personages of whom we never expected to know more than the names. Afraid that the denizens of Gorna might rise up and seize the treasure for themselves, Maspero's assistant, Emil Bruch, 
conscripted every available hand and worked day and night to empty the tomb and load the precious cargo onto a waiting ship bound for Cairo. And as the steamer made its way along the Nile, all the villagers came and they gathered along the banks of the Nile. And the women ululated and cried out in you know, sadness. And the men gave a 21-gun salute for the mummies because this was the last time the kings of Egypt were making a royal progress to the capital. In Cairo, however, the mummies received a more restrained welcome. Sadly, once the mummies arrived in Cairo, the tax officials weren't that delighted because how do you tax a whole group of mummies that have arrived in the capital city? And so they came in ignominiously as salted fish. Although it is illegal to excavate and sell illicit antiquities in nearly every country of the world, the lure of buried riches continues to attract modern tomb raiders. There is a phenomena of subsistence looting which occurs throughout the world in places like Jordan and Mali, Palestine and Latin America where people use the profits to feed their families and it is predicated on extreme living conditions and economic hardship. The situation is particularly acute in Israel and the West Bank, where most tomb raiders are poor Palestinians living on the fringe of society. Since the onset of the recent intifada in Palestine, antiquities authorities on both sides of the border have reported a rise of almost 300% in looting of archaeological sites. The, the jacket that they... And I think this is due in part to the fact that when the closure of the territories in Israel, Palestinians who once worked there were no longer able to get to their jobs and have turned to looting in their own backyards as a means of feeding their families. Perhaps no one knows this better than Amir Ganur, head of the Israel Antiquities Authority's anti-theft unit. Come, I want to, to see what is inside. I hope that there is no snakes inside, because I hate snakes. Responsible for protecting more than 7,500 archaeological sites, Ganor's small unit of officers witnessed daily the destruction caused by looters. No snakes. The robbers, they came in and they opened all the chambers, you can see the stones here, the caverns, they open it. They took from inside all the bottles of uh, glass, the oil lamps, the jewelry, everything. All the tomb raiders left behind was some graffiti, the Arabic word Allah, etched into the stone wall. The hills surrounding Jerusalem contain a treasure trove of ancient tombs. Dr. Shimon Gibson of the Jerusalem Archaeology Field Unit races to find and excavate as many as he can before the tomb raiders find them. We're in the Hinnom Valley and uh, we're looking towards the southeast. The Hinnom Valley itself encircles part of Mount Zion. This was uh, the upper city in the first century uh, AD. Um, the Aristocrats uh, live there. And on this side, there's an escarpment uh, where you have uh, some of the tombs which surrounded uh, Jerusalem. According to the Bible, the Hinnom Valley, or Gehenna, was the site of ritual infant sacrifices and held the entrance to the underworld. Time has done little to improve that reputation. Today, the Hinnom Valley is a dangerous haven for drug dealers and tomb robbers. We're here at uh, a place called Akeldama, which is at the tip of uh, the Hinnom Valley. And this is a good example of a tomb which uh, was not known and was exposed by tomb robbers. And you could see the area in front here where they've dug down. They dug down here, exposed this beautiful facade of the tomb. And you can see the difference between the gray weathering of the rock at the top, which was all that was visible of uh, this uh, tomb, 
and then they, they dug down, and that's why it's got a kind of sort of yellowish tint. This is an indication that this was only recently um, exposed. The facade is, is particularly beautiful, very well cut. A superb example of a tomb from the time of Jesus, which has been looted by uh, tomb robbers. Dr. Gibson finds that the Tomb Raiders are a relentless, industrious lot, willing to move mountains of dirt in search of riches. Yeah, it's a cave. So look around, you can see all these pits in the ground dug by the tomb robbers. And here, there's one pit. Here, I'll just get inside. Hopefully, I won't fall in. But you can see that there's been some recent work here. Um, you can see the, the soil has been moved away here. They're trying to follow the scarp there to see if they can find some hidden entrance leading in that direction. So I'm coming into the cave now, through the entrance. Nearby, Dr. Gibson is shocked to find that the Tomb Raiders have recently been at work in a cave known as the Shroud Tomb that he excavated in 1998. Ah, oh, yes. So... This is the, the original top chamber of the, the Shroud tomb. Um, at the moment, you can see there's a Norse uh, cobweb with this large spider looming over my head. But um, that's OK. Anyway, so this is the upper chamber. And over here on the left, there's another doorway which leads down to the lower chamber. The upper chamber had been robbed out in 1998, but the lower chamber was not known. Now, I haven't been there for down there for, since their original excavations. I'm a bit apprehensive. I don't want to go down and find uh, devastation of, you know, destruction of archaeological artifacts. So let's hope that uh, the looting was uh, superficial and that um, harm hasn't been done to archaeological remains. Dr. Gibson's hopes are quickly dashed. Well, I can see that some digging has taken place here. You can see that the, the soil, you can see the level of the soil here, it's been reduced by about uh, 10 centimeters. Somebody has been churning up the soil here. And look, you can see fragments of osheries. Distinctive first century bone boxes known as ossuaries once filled this cave. But tomb raiders destroyed them in their quest for valuables. And uh, there's, there's quite a few ossuary fragments. So what they've been doing is they've been digging down. There are these smashed ossuaries and they've been uh, trying to look for complete artifacts, apparently unsuccessfully. But it is a great pity. It can be quite painful to come to a tomb and to see bits of bones all over the place, um, fragments of uh, stone osheries and, and other artifacts. And from the bits and pieces, you can imagine what riches were originally inside these caves and have been carted off uh, to the antiquity dealers. In Jerusalem, the streets are filled with shops selling artifacts, like those taken from the Shroud Cave. Unlike other Middle Eastern countries, Israeli law prohibits tomb raiding, but allows the controlled sale of archaeological finds by licensed dealers. There's a paradox there. On the one hand, you have laws in this country which prohibit uh, illegal excavations. On the other hand, you have laws which um, allow for the sale of antiquities. So one doesn't sort of fit in with the other. And where do the owners get the items that they sell? Antiquities dealer Gil Chaya provides the candid answer. Most of what you see here come from illegal digs. Now, the law in Israel is that I can sit in my shop, anybody who comes with an ancient artifact to my shop and wants to sell it to me, I can buy it as long as I take his name and his ID number, mm. all right? Mm. So obviously, most of these people are Arabs that just came from uh, looting of tombs. Officially, Israeli law mandates that only artifacts discovered prior to 1978 can be bought and sold. But in reality, that law is easily circumvented. When you go in and you purchase a Roman oil lamp, it has a number on the bottom of it. And that proves that it was from a pre-1978 collection, and you are given an export permit that allows you to take that out of the country. But what 
has been happening is that once the, that particular oil lamp has been sold, some unscrupulous dealers have been taking that registry number and transferring it to an item that was post-1978 in order to increase their stock. But dealers counter that it is impossible for them to accurately determine when an ancient artifact was dug up. Also, I have in this room more items that... Dealer Kadir Baidun believes it is a reality that makes the law impossible to enforce. You see, you can visit here and see from David, from the early bronze, from Abraham. There is no way to say that this was found before 78 or after 78. I mean, there is no way to say this is after 78 or this is 100 years ago. It is a situation that angers Uzi Dahari, deputy director of the Israel Antiquities Authority. In Turkey, for example, it's illegal to sell antiquities. In Jordan, it's illegal. In Egypt, it's illegal. In Cyprus, it's illegal. In, in uh, Italy, it's illegal. In, in Greece, it's illegal. All over the country, it's, in Syria, it's illegal. In Iran, it's illegal. In Iraq, it's illegal. Only in Israel, in Lebanon, it's legal. So I think it's bad laws. We have to change it. Antiquities dealer Gideon Sasson does not agree. There is robbery of jewelry. Should we stop the trade of jewelry to avoid this? Obviously not. You have to control the trade in a way that you avoid the looting of the antiquities, but let the legal trade go on. Besides, as Egypt discovered, outlawing the sale of antiquities does not guarantee an end to tomb robbers. People doesn't know that until 1983, antiquities were sold in uh, antiquity shops in Cairo and everywhere. Unfortunately, with the stopping of sale of legal antiquities, this seems to have boosted um, tomb robbers, because now, of course, there is still that huge demand for Egyptian antiquities, but there is no legitimate supply. And thus, more and more dealers are trying to break into storage areas, tombs, and even temples in an effort to get objects to sell to people who are greedy for Egyptian art. Dropping in on another shop, Dr. Gibson is shocked to find how pervasive looted artifacts are in the legal trade. Where do you get these things from? Do you... Digging, they're all over, you know, mm. people are collectors, you know, they collection, they buy so, collection. Yeah. You know, they so have... people bring in bring uh, these in things? Yeah, mm. That's what we do. I see you have an oshery there. Yeah. Well, where's this oshery from? It's come from here in Jerusalem. Uh, from a tomb in tomb Jerusalem, around Jerusalem, yes. Because uh -huh. we've, we've just uh, been in a tomb where yeah, yeah, uh, I some know, I know. Things, similar things were. Yeah, I have a few more. Taken, no... yes. Whenever I see a, an oshery in the window of an antiques dealer, it hurts me because I know that that oshery has been ripped out of its archaeological context, and it's the archaeological context which is of importance. And all of that, of course, is lost. All you're left with is, uh, is an oshery which perhaps you could use for putting some plants in and uh, using as a kind of window box. But all of these items, now I look at them, they're the yeah. sort of items, all these bowls and things which are over here, are the sort of things that you'd find in tombs. So yeah, yeah, presumably, yeah. the people who brought these things to you have uh, taken them from tombs, yeah, so yeah. I can guess. So they find what they yeah. dig and this is the way they bring it here. But I'm interested in this context. How are those objects related to the other objects? What story does that tell us about the past? And when you rip an object out of context and send it on the antiquities market, it takes away its story. And do you have coins? Uh, yes, do, I do, do have uh, yes. shekels, I have uh, widow's might. Uh, Our coins, do you have? I do have, yes. Could we see? Uh, yes, what I is? will show you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll show you also the silver one. Uh, uh -huh. Aha, that's, that's quite rare. You know, the one with the front of the old temple here. This is where archaeology suffers because such coins are usually uh, dug up by illegal excavators and they come into uh, the, the marketplace. And you have thousands all over the world uh, which have been sold all over the world and appear in collections. But in terms of uh, archaeological excavations, only a handful have really been found in good archaeological context. It's a pity that we don't have these things in situ in, at the archaeological sites themselves. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because of the paradoxical laws, the only way anyone can be punished for handling looted artifacts in Israel is to actually catch them in the act of digging them up. That is why each night, the anti-theft officers of the Israel Antiquities Authority head out to patrol the Israeli countryside. Armed with automatic weapons and night vision scopes, the 10-member unit protects the numerous archaeological sites along the vast Palestinian frontier known as the Green Line. The Israel Antiquities Authority is doing a remarkable job in trying to monitor those sites where illegal excavations are taking place. But still, the illegal excavations unit has an impossible task because they've got to be everywhere all of the time, and that's an impossibility. Despite the long odds against them, the team's hard work and persistence pay off on the night of May 16, 2003. Push on. Following up on a tip, they catch a group of Tomb Raiders in the act. One of the men nabbed in the raid is Khalid Mohammed Gonimat, now serving a six-month sentence in Shatta prison. The convicted Tomb Raider tells about that fateful night. I am jobless. When I heard that people are working and getting money, I went to work. I wanted to work because I have bills for water, electricity, and I have kids that go to school. I didn't know that I was not supposed to work in the site I was working in. There was no sign to indicate that this is an archaeological site. If there was a written sign saying you are not allowed to work or dig in the area, it would be different. There was no warning. As for myself, I apologized, and I'm apologizing again. I don't like to do any harm. I'm not a plunderer. I just wanted to provide for my kids. Sadly, Tomb Raiders hardly ever realize that simple dream. Despite the risks they take, the poor people who actually loot the tombs rarely reap the financial rewards of the items they discover. The middlemen are the people who retain the lion's share of the profits. The looter himself only receives 1% to 2% of the money. The middleman then sells to the dealer, who then sells to either the tourist population, the auction trade, or just to the general public. That inequity becomes even greater when the antiquities leave Israel and make their way onto the international art market. Thousands, millions, billions. No one knows how much money changes hands for international black market antiquities. But every expert agrees that the sale of looted artifacts is big business. The low end, we've had people saying, oh, well, it's, you know, it's 250,000 pounds a year, maybe globally. Um, and then at the other end, we, I think we had an Interpol estimate a few years ago where they came up with $4 billion. In most nations, it is a crime to export antiquities. And yet, a steady stream of illicit booty continues to flow out of these countries to dealers and auction houses in places like London. When you look through antiquities catalogues, you find that somewhere between 85 and 95 percent don't have any provenance. And it's almost certainly the case that all of this is loot. So there would, it's fair to say, I think, be almost no auction business in antiquities without loot. To combat the growing problem, England's famed Scotland Yard established a special arts and antiquities squad in 1989. But Detective Dick Ellis soon learned that hunting down international antiquity smugglers was radically different from busting shoplifters. Often the victims were countries, and they didn't even know they'd been robbed. You had problems in proving the object was stolen if it had come from an illicit excavation when there was no record of it ever, ever having existed anywhere in the world before. Ellis became frustrated as case after case hit a dead end. Then in 1994, his squad finally got a break. 
when a man walked into the British Museum and asked the experts there to translate an ancient Egyptian papyrus. Well, there are only about 15 people in the world actually could read them, uh, and I think three of them happened to be at the museum, including the guys who'd excavated them. So it really didn't take the specialists long to realize that what they were looking at was stolen. The stolen papyrus led Detective Ellis on a journey into the underbelly of London's illicit antiquities ring, a world of smugglers and fixers. Everywhere he probed, the leads all pointed to a notorious art restorer named Jonathan Tokley Parry. More incredible good fortune. Learning that Tokley Parry was away in Egypt, Detective Ellis decided to push through a warrant and search his house. Forcing entry into Tokli Parry's home, Ellis and his squad were stunned to find it littered with Egyptian antiquities. But were they stolen? Methodically searching each room, Detective Ellis happened upon a cache of photographs which held the answer. Amazingly, they showed in step-by-step -step detail how Tokli Parry had smuggled artifacts out of Egypt. His particular technique was to go to Egypt and acquire objects and then cover them in varnish and paint so that they looked like sort of modern jujures and hand carry them out as modern handicrafts which had no cultural significance and attracted uh, no tax. In England, where he had his workshop, he would carefully take off all this coating to reveal the genuine antiquity. Tokli Parry had apparently thought of everything. Even an ingenious way to make an illicit artifact seem legitimate, with a little help from a long deceased relative. Jonathan Tokley Parry had had an uncle or a great uncle who had traveled to Egypt in the 1920s and 30s. So they created a collection around this individual and they took labels and soaked them in tea and put them in the microwave to make them look like they were old labels. And they would decide which objects should be placed in this collection. And then when they came to market these objects in the United States and in England, they would say this came out of this old collection. Continuing his search, Ellis uncovered more damaging evidence in the bedroom. Under a bed, we found two painted wall reliefs of a uh, striding figure. Um, and these were in boxed sets. They were ready for the market. Ellis's instinct told him these figures were important, and experts from the British Museum soon confirmed it. They identified the reliefs as pieces hacked from the false door of an Egyptian tomb. And they believed they knew just which one. Ellis and his men had nearly completed their search of Tokli Parry's house when suddenly the front door swung open. And in walked Jonathan Tokli Parry, straight back from Heathrow Airport. Despite finding the police ransacking his home, Tokli Parry remained amazingly cool. He said, yes, he'd just come from Egypt. And I opened his suitcase, and in there he had um, a little broken handle with a Greek stamp mark on it from a, a clay pitcher or some such, which he said, yes, he had picked up from the floor of a tomb. When I said, but isn't that stealing? His response was, well, yes, it is, but it's only a technical theft. Rifling through Tokli Parry's bag, Ellis found another fascinating item, a detailed personal journal. Tokli Parry uh, saw himself, I think, as a colorful man, and he described himself as either 003 and a half or 004 and a half, halfway to James Bond because of all the skullduggery uh, in this field. But perhaps the most crucial information Ellis gleaned from Tokli Parry's journal was the name of a possible co-conspirator, a New York antiquities dealer named Frederick Schultz. 
the most valuable piece that Tokli Parry spirited out of Egypt was undoubtedly the head of Amenhotep III. That head was sold through Frederick Schultz in New York as part of the Alcock collection to a South African dealer who subsequently sold it on to a London dealer called Robin Symes for $1.4 million. But did Schultz know the head was stolen? Ellis's inquiry showed that the man ran a legitimate gallery. Why would he take a chance on such a risky venture? Feeling confident about the case? We have no problem. When a dealer deals with something of a high quality in Egyptian antiquities, it's a total loser. It's a distinctive style. It wasn't wandering around the world like Roman stuff. Egypt has to come from Egypt. It's got to be. And since Egypt has an absolute law against uh, exportation of anything, it's a loser. Only to be done by stupid people. Despite the fact that he had uncovered a treasure trove of evidence, Ellis knew that he was still missing crucial pieces of the puzzle. We needed to be able to prove that objects that we had seized in the United Kingdom were in fact stolen from Egypt. Fortunately, his friends at the British Museum were able to help out once again. The museum had researched it and identified the false door reliefs that we'd found under the bed in Tokli Parry's cottage as having come from the tomb of Hetep Ka in Saqqara. Ellis realized that if he documented the connection to the tomb of Hetepka, he could nail Jonathan Tokli Perry and close the case. Now all he had to do was travel halfway around the world to do it. In November 1994, Dick Ellis traveled to the barren Egyptian desert to try to find that proof. And so we drove out to Saqqara at about four o'clock in the afternoon. We entered the tomb. And what we found in there was, can only be described as a scene of devastation. Comparing the devastation with photographs of the false doors discovered under Tokli Parry's bed, Ellis was able to conclusively document that the artifacts had come from the tomb of Hetepka. It made you very angry that, uh, that really, just for personal greed, this tomb had been completely destroyed. How do you replace something that stood for 5,000 years? You can't. It's gone. With all of the evidence collected, Ellis returned to England and presented his case. Jonathan Tokley Parry was found guilty in 1997 on two counts of dishonestly handling antiquities and sentenced to six years in prison. Five years later, Frederick Schultz was also found guilty for his part in conspiring to receive, possess, and sell stolen property in violation of the United States National Stolen Property Act. He was fined $50,000 and sentenced to 33 months in prison. And I think the judge in New York in the Fred Schultz case had it right when he said, I'm not going to fine you very heavily because people like you are not deterred by a fine. I'm going to send you to jail for a long time. The prosecution of Tokley Perry in London and Frederick Schultz in New York were of immense importance because this was the first time that you had actually taken a complete cycle of illicit trafficking from the source country through the marketplace countries and, and out into the collectors and successfully prosecuted. Ambassador, on behalf of the New York office of the FBI, uh, the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, we would like to return to you what is rightfully the Egyptian government. Thank you very much. Thank you. In May 2003, Egyptian officials traveled to New York City to take possession of an artifact confiscated by the FBI during the Frederick Schultz investigation. It's really a pleasure to be here today in uh, this very special moment when the American government are returning this dealer to Egypt. For Zahi Hawass, Secretary General of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, the return of the Stella was a joyful event. 
when I see an artifact that I bring back to Egypt, I feel like my heart is trembling because I feel that a piece of my heart is back. To return the artifacts to their motherland, it's very important, as if if you had children and your children left you, they will never stay outside. They have to come back to their father, to their family. And therefore, these artifacts belong to Egypt. It has to be in Egypt. But for Hawass, the return of the artifacts from the Schultz case is not an ending. It is just the beginning of a much larger campaign. As an Egyptian, I would love uh, the past of uh, Nefertiti to be back to Cairo. The Rosetta Stone, those are something that we cannot really see outside Egypt. They should be in Egypt. April 2003, coalition forces invaded Baghdad, Iraq, and the city exploded in a wave of lawlessness. Angry looters swarmed the National Museum of Iraq. Smashing open display cases, the mob stole or destroyed priceless treasures spanning more than 7,000 years of history. When I heard about the looting of the National Museum in Baghdad, I was just struck with horror, primarily because I know for a fact that a group of professionals had gone to the Pentagon more than once and had warned them that this specific thing would happen. And the Pentagon said yes, yes, and did nothing. There are, in addition to the Baghdad Museum, other museums that are also have been looted or destroyed, a significant museum in the northern part of the country in Mosul. And now we are getting information that sites are being looted, uh, including trucks that are driving up and removing wall reliefs. And in fact, there were even people who showed up with guns to remove objects. If recent history is any indication, it is these isolated archaeological sites that will suffer the most devastating destruction at the hands of looters. Prior to the 91 Gulf War, the site of Nineveh in Mosul in northern Iraq was a site museum where people could visit the restored remains of a Assyrian palace and view the sculptures lining the walls. Uh, in the mid-1990s, looters came in and broke those sculptures up, exporting small fragments for the art market and leaving the rest as rubble on the ground. Roughly at the same time, in southern Iraq, Uma, an ancient Babylonian city from about 2000 BC, appears to have been looted with people with bulldozers. Um, the site turned from a relatively smooth archaeological mound into something that looks like the surface of the moon. In the wake of the 1991 Gulf War, the looting grew so alarmingly that Saddam Hussein implemented harsh new penalties, including execution. The most dramatic report of an execution was a group of thieves in Mosul who went to one of the Assyrian palaces outside the city and cut the head off of a large human-headed bull sculpture. Well, they were caught, and Saddam decreed that their punishment should be to have their heads cut off as well in the same way. Today, order is slowly returning to Iraq, allowing military officials their first opportunity to fully assess the damage done to archaeological sites and initiate a hunt for stolen artifacts. If we recover items, no matter where they are recovered, they will be returned to their rightful owner, the Iraqi people, I mean, the regardless of where they're, where they're discovered. There have been a wide variety of reports about what was stolen from the Iraq Museum, and that seems to have evolved from the fear that everything was gone, which was the first reports, to a much more nuanced version at present, which states that some 30 very important pieces were stolen from the galleries and unknown thousands more were stolen from the storage rooms. Throughout history, antiquities and archaeological sites have often been the victims of war. When Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt in 1798, his expeditionary force included 150 artists, scientists, and scholars, whose sole mission was to record and collect Egyptian antiquities. They made numerous fantastic finds, 
including the key to deciphering hieroglyphics, the Rosetta Stone. So prized were the items these French savants collected that English Admiral Horatio Nelson insisted some be included in the surrender agreement when he defeated Napoleon's fleet at Aboukir Bay in 1801. As a result, the British Museum received the Rosetta Stone and a portion of the countless other Egyptian masterpieces destined for the Louvre in Paris. The Louvre is, uh, I suppose you could say, it's a, a museum in honor of victories at war, because most of the stuff is stolen by Napoleon or somebody else. The British Museum is a divine repository of things grabbed during the colonial period. Oh, you can't have those disgusting idols, we'll take them. So you won't have to bow down in front of some sort of heathen thing. Colonial power is bigger than you are, takes your stuff. The wanton theft of antiquities outraged the Egyptian Pasha Muhammad Ali. On August 15, 1835, he published an impassioned editorial against the practice. Foreigners are destroying ancient edifices, extracting stones and other worked objects and exporting them to foreign countries. If this continues, it is clear that soon no more ancient monuments will remain in Egypt. Nevertheless, European expeditions continue to export artifacts from Egypt well into the 20th century. One of the most controversial objects in any museum is the bust of Nefertiti. This actually this is an icon of Egyptian art, but it resides in Berlin. This bust has been taken out of Egypt, probably illegally, um, in the early part of the 20th century. The First World War started and everybody get out of Egypt, particularly Germany, and they just did not declare that Nefertiti bust had ever been found, and they just put it in a crate and got it out of there when they left. And the Egyptians are very annoyed at that, and they should be. Public outrage over the Nefertiti bust was so great that the Berlin Museum did not display the masterpiece for more than 10 years. It was finally exhibited in 1924 and remains a part of their collection to this day. Oddly and ironically enough, the most frequent poster you see all over Cairo, and particularly in the museum, is Nefertiti's bust, which is, of course, in Berlin. And the Rosetta Stone, I think there are posters of that. And you, some people walk into the Cairo Museum expecting to see them both, and indeed leave thinking they have. While the Nefertiti incident inflamed Egyptian resentment, it was nothing compared to the explosion that occurred in 1922. Ironically, the man who lit the fuse was Howard Carter, the man who discovered the famous tomb of Tutankhamun. It was the archaeological find of the century. In 1922, Englishman Howard Carter uncovered one of Egypt's finest treasures, the tomb of the boy king, Tutankhamun. In his 10 long years of excavations, Carter received international fame for his diligent work, but none of the riches. Until 1922, the standard procedure in archaeology is that if the Americans or the French or the Swiss or whatever paid for a dig and they found something, they would get half of their discovery. Then after Howard Carter's unbelievable stupid activities at uh, Tutankhamun, uh, the Egyptian government canceled that and uh, seized everything, that half of which should have gone to Carter. Carter was forced to relinquish his share of the Tutankhamun hoard when Egyptian authorities accused him of being a tomb robber. While taking an inventory, officials discovered a fabulous artifact hidden in the expedition's pantry and quickly concluded that Carter was attempting to secretly sneak it out of the country. Howard Carter tried to steal that lovely, lovely little wooden head. They found it in a wine case in the storage. And he said, oh, well, I put it there because it was so hectic the first days it happened to end up in a wine case. Thanks a lot. But we know of other things Howard Carter stole from Tutankhamun and uh, he and Canaveral sold on the market. 
But was Howard Carter really a tomb robber? Not everyone believes the charge. I still believe from reading and studying the history of Carter, he was really someone who cares a lot about the tomb. And that's why I do not think that Howard Carter did steal any inner artifacts. The charges against Howard Carter of trying to steal this wooden head uh, were probably politically motivated more than anything else. The Antiquities Department was looking for an excuse to stage a kind of uprising against the British authority, uh, who was kind of represented by Howard Carter, and were vying for control over this greatest archaeological discovery in the history of Egypt, and of course, arguably, in the history of archaeology itself. Hoving stands by his assessment, pointing out that museums of the time often collected larcenous booty. The first director of the Metropolitan Museum was one of the biggest art pirates of all time, Luigi Palma di Cesnola, and he was the consul in Cyprus. And he became fascinated with the Cypriot art. He was lying around the fields and had this private collection, and the Met, being very smart, decided they would hire their first director, who also had a big collection. And indeed, he gave it all to the Met. Succeeding directors often followed in Cesnola's footsteps readily acquiring illicit artworks. When I was a young curator in the 60s and director of the museum in, in the early 70s, I was known in the business as uh, a shark because I ate everything in sight, collecting. I was rabid. But it was a matter of macho pride to get the good stuff. And you really didn't care where it came from. And even if it, you knew that it came from an illegal dig, someplace you'd kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and uh, you know, kind of be uh, but then it all came to an end in 1970-71. We just realized, finally, that the age of piracy was over, and we had to grow up. And we did, overnight. Triggering that change was a sweeping international treaty proposed by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, in 1970, which gave members a legal right to demand the return of stolen artifacts. When finally ratified by the United States in 1983 and Great Britain in 2002, the treaty became a powerful tool in the fight against art pirates and tomb raiders in countries like Egypt. We are recording now uh, any stolen artifact that has been gone from Egypt, from a tomb or from a temple or from any location in Egypt that left Egypt after 1970. In the same time, we sent letters to every director of museums all over the world to tell them, if you buy a stolen artifact, you will never excavate in Egypt, you will never work in the Cairo Museum, you will never do any kind of cooperation with us. And I mean it, and I did put three names of three Egyptologists on the blacklist because of their involvement in stolen artifacts. The campaign has already shown results. In June 2002, the tenacious Hawass complained to Christie's auction house that their catalog included a granite relief that had been plundered from the Temple of Isis at Beibit al Hagara. Christie's immediately pulled the item and returned it to Egypt. You know, since the last year, I almost every week I receive a piece coming back from outside Italy, England, Switzerland, America, everywhere. And this really makes me very happy. This artifact fever seems to be spreading. In 2003, Emory University voluntarily donated a mummy to Egypt, which they purchased from a defunct Niagara Falls Museum of Curiosities. Thought to have come from the infamous tomb raiding Abdel Rasul family, some experts believe that it is the mummy of a famous pharaoh, perhaps even Ramses I. This mummy is going to come back because the people at Emory believe that as a royal mummy, it should have its home in Egypt. Although when it was purchased and taken from Egypt, it was taken totally legitimately under the current laws of the land. Flush with success, the irrepressible Hawass now sets his sights on bigger game. The return of cultural masterpieces stolen centuries ago. When I was even started to think that I would be an archaeologist, 
It was in my mind that I would like to see the bust of Nefertiti inside the Cairo Museum. And from the British Museum, the uh, Rosetta Stone, the Zodiac at the Louvre, the statues of Hatshepsut from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Those really are the pieces that I dream that they should be here. But can Hawass force the return of items taken prior to the 1970 UNESCO cutoff date? The opinions on the subject are divided and fierce. Should the Egyptians get the Nefertiti back? Probably not, because under UNESCO, there was a time that before that, all forgiven. It's nasty, but hey, that's part of the deal. I think that the idea of a statute of limitations isn't useful when talking about repatriating cultural property. I'm somewhat conflicted about whether masterpieces like the Nefertiti bust or the more important objects like the Rosetta Stone should be returned uh, to the countries from which they came, uh, in part because of the lessons from the recent looting of the Baghdad Museum. In some ways, it's a very good thing that these objects are spread around the world. Having one's heritage returned to one is a very important part of one's national identity. And certainly for national pride, certain iconic objects should be returned to Egypt. But on the other hand, it is very good to have Egyptian artifacts and museums throughout the world because these are Egypt's best and finest ambassadors. Oas remains firm, believing that his fight is righteous. I'm going to win based on the international law first. When I finish this, I will go beyond that and ask for the major artifacts to come to Egypt. I'm not going to ask for the UNESCO to give us another extension or anything like that, but I think there is a time that we really need to return thousands of artifacts. Jerusalem 2002. The archaeological and Christian communities were rocked by the sudden appearance of a burial box or ossuary engraved with a tantalizing inscription. In English it reads, James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus, which obviously has awesome implications for a New Testament study and the origins of Christianity. Could this ossuary have once held the bones of James, the brother of Jesus? There was just one problem. This ossuary was almost certainly looted. Came onto the antiquities market when Oded Galan, the man who owns it now, bought it. That immediately raises the suspicion of whether or not it's a forgery. Despite these misgivings, the ossuary was unveiled at a special exhibit in the Royal Ontario Museum. It received instant international acclaim, which angered some experts. The James Ossuary is an example of a piece about which nothing at all is known except that it miraculously appeared suddenly one day and the world was looking at it, scholars were talking about it. The Royal Ontario Museum exhibited in a sort of special greatest artifact ever found setting, which catapulted its value from the price of a stone box to the price of a one-of-a-kind religious relic, uh, one of the greatest finds of all time. Nothing about the ossuary deserved that. The ossuary drove a wedge through the archaeological community, pitting its supporters against scholars like John Russell, who refused to even look at the looted artifacts. Some of these very refined, elevated, supposedly, scholars say, oh, if it came from the market, we don't want to look at it. Well, I mean, I wish that it had been professionally excavated. But given the choice between looking at it and ignoring it, I've got to say any sensible person will look at it. So the argument then, then becomes, where do you draw the line? How do you decide? What object is of sufficient importance um, that you're prepared to overlook its possible dubious origins? Supporters of the James Ossuary point out that the same question was once asked of the fabulous Dead Sea Scrolls, which were also discovered by tomb robbers and mysteriously appeared as black market antiquities on the eve of Israel's independence in 1948. There was great strife in the Holy Land. 
There was barbed wire separating the Arab part of Jerusalem from the Jewish part. Ignoring the danger, Israeli scholar Eliezer Sukhanik secretly traveled to the Arab-held town of Bethlehem and successfully purchased three of the rare scrolls. And it was almost messianic, apocalyptic. The Sukhanik came back with these scrolls in his hand. At the same time, the, the streets of Jerusalem were going wild with glee and gladness because the Jewish state was to be created again after 2,000 years. But some scholars initially refused to believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls were authentic because they had been ripped from their archaeological context by tomb raiders. It was not until the looters revealed the location of the original caves and archaeologists completely excavated the site that the authenticity and value of the Dead Sea Scrolls was finally accepted. Many wondered, would the James Ossuary one day achieve the same legitimacy? That prospect seemed to dim in June 2003 with a shocking announcement from the Israel Antiquities Authority. After three months of studying the James Ossuary, a panel of IAA experts concluded that while the stone box itself was indeed from the first century AD, the time of Jesus, parts of the inscription were a modern forgery. First of all, I must say that the Oshuari is not a fake. The Oshuari is genuine. The inscription on the Oshuari is a fake. When the Oshuari's owner, Oded Golan, was subsequently arrested on suspicion of making and selling fake artifacts, the case seemed to be closed. Or was it? There are some scholars who still today, even after the report of the Israel Antiquities Authority, they still believe that it's authentic, or at least part of that inscription is authentic. So who knows? I think the, that discussion about the authenticity of this inscription is going to go on for quite a while. Since the artifact itself provides such conflicting clues, the only hope for ending the controversy would seem to be in locating the tomb from which the James Ossuary was taken. Rumors are rampant concerning its location. One of the indications that the, the Oded Golan apparently sort of seemed to indicate at one point in time that this Oshui could have come from the Shroud tomb. But even if the tomb robbers revealed where the Oshuary was found, archaeologists doubt that any evidence would remain to help authenticate that it once held the bones of James, the brother of Jesus. When an artifact is removed from its context in a looting situation, it loses all meaning and we can never reconstruct where it came from or how long it had been there or the kind of people that used it because we don't know where it came from. Material that's been kind of wrenched out of the ground in that way has lost all its contextual information and in fact exists only as an object and doesn't tell us anything like the amount that we could have learned if the site had been left intact. Because the box was not excavated scientifically, there is much we will never know about the box. And the most important thing we'll never know, is it in fact the ossuary of James, the brother of Jesus? Today, the worldwide looting of priceless archaeological sites continues to escalate at an alarming rate. A sad reality which Officer Ron Kahati of the Israel Antiquities Authority encounters daily on his patrols. As you can see, they came through here. They broke this stone. It used to be one piece. They broke it here from the outside. So they got into the coffin. They took everything out. You can see here, all the skeleton is out, scattered like this. And what they were looking is if there's something with the skeleton, maybe a ring, a jewelry, something that they can take and sell. It's horrible. You, you can't imagine someone coming into a grave like this and break it all, damage it like this. 
Kahari finds that Tomb Raiders are becoming more ruthless in their quest for loot. In a rare behind-the-scenes tour of the IAA storerooms, he shows off some of the weapons that have recently been confiscated from looters. Okay, you see this one, actually we have the date on it. We found it last year in Hakeldama, but this is not a digging tool, let's say it this way. I never found, you know, someone who's digging with this. I don't know why they had it. I have my ideas, but I have this in my hand now, not in my head, so it's better. We have all kinds of uh, metal detectors that usually each group who are uh, digging have one like this. We consider it as a weapon. Technology provides brazen tomb robbers with the means to savagely attack artifacts, even in remote places like Nepal. To remove a small panel of art, just a face, for example, what one does is one hacks all the way around so that scenes on all sides are completely destroyed. Also, sometimes bulldozers or large-scale machinery is used. So to get into a tomb or a temple, they just take a huge caterpillar and then eat away at a corner of this building, destroying anything that stands in the path. Ironically, even computers are linked to the worldwide increase in archaeological looting. Really, the internet has caused tremendous problems because it's broadening out the consumer base, because it's providing so much really inexpensive material. There is now a new outlet for the low end of the market through such outlets as eBay. And you can go on eBay and find less valuable objects that may or may not be genuine, but now being sold. In the past, such objects might just be discarded and destroyed because there was no market for them. With no end in sight, experts wonder, how can Tomb Raiders be stopped? I really want to stop the theft in Egypt. And this is why the most important thing that we are doing right now, we are building a new storage magazine that will see them completely safe, electronically guarded. All these old magazines are gone. We are changing also the guard who is guarding our monuments with a stick. This will never be happen again. We have educated people who call them security guards who will be in charge of guarding our antiquities. But such improvements cost money, a luxury most nations can ill afford. Some critics counter that a better deterrent to looting would be for nations to open their own shops. There are some things which antiquities departments have thousands of. In Israel and Jordan, for example, they have these little oil lamps. Get rid of some of the duplicates and put the looters out of business. At the moment, they are very short of budget. They cannot do the necessary things for the excavations. Why not to sell these objects? It will enable them to improve the archaeological digs, to have budget for other researchers, and to leave space for new objects to come. But not everyone agrees. I am opposed it totally. I know that other people in the IA are not, the, not in, on, in my opinion, but I am against it. I think this is a national property. A national property is not only a matter of money, it's significance. Besides, some critics question whether selling duplicates would have the desired effect. The countries are not going to put on the market the major significant pieces, the so-called museum quality pieces. And the truth is that the museums in the West and the collectors in the West want the museum quality pieces. They are not going to be satisfied with just another juglet that anybody can buy for $20. They want the million dollar or the multi-million dollar piece. So, if those kinds of objects are not placed on the market, it's quite clear that the looting will continue. So what is the answer? The main aim, I think, is to make illicit antiquities a little bit like ivory, a little bit like fur. Uh, it's something that you shouldn't trade in. 
We need to educate people, just as the environmental protection movement has significantly changed attitudes in this country. The archaeological community has to be more proactive and take that level of education very seriously. The reaction that anyone who cares about the past should have when seeing a looted antiquity is to feel sick and vomit right on the spot and, if possible, on the, on the collector. Progress is being made. Many wealthy museums are now forging alliances with poorer nations, paying cold cash for the exclusive right to exhibit traveling antiquities. If you're a museum owner, if you have a collection, well, the people come and see it once, they come and see it twice, but are they going to come a third time? You know, they've seen it. Whereas if you have continual cycle of loans, as it were, your exhibitions will be changing all the time, and so the people will keep coming back. Ultimately, the most effective way to fight looters may also be the simplest. Preserving archaeological sites as revenue-generating tourist attractions. I think it's very important to try to develop sites as long-term resources rather than as short-term resources so that the local people actually profit by having them left there. They should be encouraged like the model in Sipan in Peru. Looters there have now become the protectors of archaeological sites because cultural tourism is now a big economic incentive and they make a lot of money off of that in the local community. In the Sudan, I try and explain to the, the people who we're working with exactly what we're doing and why it's important and interesting. And the local people, in fact, see us as a kind of benefit coming in. We pump a little money into the economy and so on. So they want us to be happy and, and continue working at the site. And maybe they're just a little bit conscientious, too, and want to uh, protect their cultural heritage. No matter what solutions prove effective, Everyone agrees that something needs to be done immediately. Egyptian sites are littered with pottery, and when people come to visit, they think, oh, it doesn't do any harm to take off a piece of pottery and take it home as a souvenir. But in actual fact, it does. You're removing part of the history. You're taking away a part of the site and of Egypt's heritage and, as a consequence, the world's heritage. Antiquity sites don't multiply. Uh, there's a certain number there, we don't know how much is there under the ground, but it gets smaller and smaller all the time. And the level of loss is accelerating all the time, and that's the problem. The stakes are high, literally the history of the world. Can Tomb Raiders be stopped before it's too late? Or will they steal away our past, piece by piece, until it is gone forever? I'm Josh Bernstein from Digging for the Truth, here in the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. You might recognize this place from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. This is where Indy and his dad found the Holy Grail. But behind fantastic movies like that one, there are deeper truths to be found. Tonight, we'll get a glimpse into the surprising and sometimes perilous world of the archaeologist. More hostile groups, poisonous snakes, and booby traps await. And on a good day, incredible discoveries too. The Real Tomb Hunters begins now, here on the History Channel. Hacking through the jungle. Plunging into hidden tombs and crumbling temples. All in the pursuit of unimaginable riches. The Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, the secrets of the past. This is the life of the fictional explorers and adventurers popularized in movies and video games, with titles like The Mummy, King Solomon's Mines, Tomb Raiders, and of course, the world-famous Indiana Jones movies. 
But against this standard, how do real-life archaeologists measure up? We all carry machetes, and we, all, we have snake bite kits. You might have a foot race with a sandstorm. We had a bunch of gunfights here this year as people came in trying to kill me. The adventures and the dangers all do exist. But here, there are no special effects, no stuntmen, no retakes, and no guarantee of a sequel. There's a certain point when it's everyone for himself. These are the everyday exploits, past and present, of real-life adventurers and archaeologists, those who some might call the real tomb hunters. Archaeology, the study of man's ancient past, is a surprisingly young science. Until the late 1800s, archaeology was little better than tomb robbing, a largely destructive practice, very much as it's portrayed in the movies. Everybody is familiar with the first 10 minutes of Indiana Jones when he goes for that golden statue at the beginning. And, you know, he destroyed everything but that. It was Egypt that first bore the brunt of these amateurs in the 1800s. Men like Howard Vise, a British colonel who used gunpowder to clear the tombs, and Italian Giovanni Belzoni, a former circus strongman who used hydraulics to wrench gigantic statues of the pharaohs out of the sand. Belzoni was not educated in archaeology. He was just trying quickly to discover things, going inside the tomb of Siti and taking the sarcophagus your device came and he opened uh, shafts and the entrance of the pyramids with dynamite. We have to uh, distinguish between real archaeologists and adventurers. All this were just adventurers like Indiana Jones. Real archaeology, with its scientific precepts, would come to Egypt 100 years after Belzoni. In the form of a less destructive but equally determined Englishman, named Howard Carter. It was Carter who would make archaeology a household word and forever link it with the idea of unimaginable treasure. It was Carter's talent as an artist that brought him to Egypt in 1891, when he was just 17. Hired by a London exploration society to sketch hieroglyphics, the young Carter spent more than a decade exploring the pyramids of the pharaohs, sometimes sleeping at night in the bat-infested tombs he was immortalizing. In 1905, by chance, Carter met a rich traveler from London who would change his life. The Earl of Carnarvon, an avid collector of Egyptology, hired the now 33-year-old to oversee a series of treasure hunting excavations. It would become his life's work. For a decade, Carter helped amass one of the most valuable collections of Egyptian artifacts ever held in private hands. But that output slowed to a trickle when he became obsessed with searching for the tomb of a lost king, Tutankhamun. Digging in isolated locations that yielded little but sand. Carter was a real archaeologist. Carter was, uh, was a patient man. He was excavating in the Valley of the Kings, trying to uh, excavate systematically. But by 1922, Lord Carnarvon had had enough. Lord Carnarvon wanted to stop giving him money to excavate and told him, give me the last opportunity. This is the last season, and after that, I'm not going to take any money from you. Carnarvon agreed to one last season. For Carter, now 44 years old, it was now or never. On November 4th, in the Valley of the Kings, the long shot paid off. Carter's men uncovered the first of four steps that would lead to an undisturbed royal tomb and a treasure never before imagined. At its center, a solid gold sarcophagus weighing some 2,500 pounds. Inside the tomb, there is about 5,000 artifacts has been found. And if you look at the golden mask, it's amazing. There is a beautiful statue, so King Tut as a young boy, coming out of the lotus, 
all of these are the are unique artifacts. If you go to the Cairo Museum, that has more than 150,000 artifacts, King Tut artifacts are the best. A small portion of the treasure, some 50 pieces, would eventually tour the world. Its insurance value? A staggering $680 million. The scope and spectacle of the discovery created a furor. And the headlines only intensified when Lord Carnarvon died unexpectedly, just five months after witnessing the opening of the tomb. Carnarvon, only 57, was said to have died from pneumonia or an infected insect bite. But press speculation soon centered on a so-called curse of the pharaohs. But the first whispers of a curse had started on the day that the tomb was opened, circulated by Carter's workmen and centered on the archaeologist's pet canary. Uh, Howard Carter came that season from England, and he uh, had a canary bird in his hand. And the workmen told him that this canary bird will give luck to us. Then maybe the tomb will be found. Then uh, while he was digging, he found the entrance of the tomb, and he knew that this is a tomb that he was looking for more than 40 years. And he went back to his tent, and he found that the canary bird was killed by a snake. The snake was a cobra, the same as the serpent depicted on the young king's death mask, a symbol of the goddess Wajit, his protector. To the workmen, it was a disturbing omen. Carter himself was spared, living to the age of 65 and spending much of his remaining years completing a detailed inventory of the tomb's contents. But the stories of a curse refused to die. From that point on, in all popular fiction, tombs were depicted as a place of deadly hazards. The curse was a warning. Booby traps and other dangers awaited those who failed to heed it. But is there any truth behind these stories? Ask those who have dared to enter and met the danger head on. Anyone who could stay five minutes inside this chamber could die. An ancient, undisturbed tomb, the holy grail for any real life archaeologist, and an essential part of every archaeological fiction. From the mummy to Indiana Jones, the tomb is always at the center of the story. It's the ultimate prize containing both treasure and mystery. Not to mention collapsing walls, hair trigger blades, venomous snakes, and the occasional bottomless pit. But do places like this really exist? One possibility is the tomb of Shu Huangdi, China's first emperor, buried near Xi'an. Since 1974, 8,000 fantastic, life-size sculptures surrounding the tomb have been excavated. The tomb's central chamber is said to contain a treasure in gold, jade, and gems. But an ancient written account describes the hazards of disturbing it. Rumored to be protected by concealed tripwires, bronze-tipped arrows, and hidden pits, it has never been fully excavated. The costs and the dangers are too great. Such speculation aside, there is real evidence that the curses and booby traps that are so much a part of Hollywood lore do have a parallel in real life, as Zahi Hawass, Egypt's leading archaeologist, can attest. They tried very hard to hide their tombs. Then they began to build maze corridors under the ground. They designed it like this to deceive the thieves. And the ancient Egyptian tried very hard to stop thieves of entering inside and uh, steal the precious artifacts. Hawass has personally opened more than 100 tombs, and more than once has found a nasty surprise waiting inside. Archaeology is dangerous uh, in general. If you're going to be afraid of snakes or earthquakes or scorpions or anything like this, you'll never do anything. If you are actually a real archaeologist, you will never think about uh, having a curse or died of an accident inside a tomb or anything. The curse inscriptions he's encountered 
haven't deterred him. If anyone will touch my tomb, will be eaten by the hippo, the lion, and the scorpion. But he has learned to proceed with caution. Ever since opening a long hidden tomb in the Giza Plateau in the spring of 1993, Hawass had cleared the entrance and was just approaching the funeral goods, a row of ancient statues, when the earth literally moved. There was about space like this. When I looked at this inside, I saw the eyes of a statue. In the same minute of that discovery happened, there was a big earthquake. Hawass was forced to evacuate the tomb, and his attempt to return was no more successful. I uh, actually went back next week to try to open the statues. And when I entered inside the tomb, I had a heart attack. Hawass had 22 days in the hospital to ponder the question, was he the victim of the mummy's curse? And I was laughing because I don't really believe in the curse of the pharaohs. You know, this happened by accident. I was working hard and I was a heavy smoker at that time. Then anything can happen like this. Though Hawass discounts curses, he believes in taking precautions when opening a tomb. I always careful in one thing. When I discover a tomb, I never enter right away until the bad air will go out and the fresh air will get in. And number two, I never shave when I'm excavating. Because when you shave, things can open here, can any germ can hit the person and can die. In 1999, German microbiologist Gotthard Kramer confirmed that mummies can carry microscopic varieties of hazardous and even deadly mold spores. But these are inadvertent hazards. What about the booby traps made famous in the first Indiana Jones movie? They did make traps to try to stop the thieves of entering inside. Then when the Egyptians in the Middle Kingdom built their pyramids, they made these maze corridors. They put in the corridors traps. It was like uh, made of wood. When they enter between them, it catch their, their legs. Then they, 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 they catch legs and hands, and then they stay there until they die. And when the first archaeologists entered inside these pyramids, they found many thieves, skeletons, hanging in their head and their legs. Hawass knows only too well how those thieves felt. He experienced a booby trap firsthand in the spring of 2002 while excavating an area that's been called the Valley of the Golden Mummies near Baharia in northern Egypt. We discovered until now about 234 mummies. Most of them were covered with gold. More tombs were discovered in the nearby town of El Buiti, where houses had been built directly above them. I went uh, to the house of an old lady, and from the area near the bathroom, I went to the rope down for about 25 feet, and I found myself in a maze corridor of tombs, uh, beautifully decorated. The beauty of the underground tombs was tempered by the fact the modern town sewage system occupied the same space. It was very difficult for us to go through, and uh, it was really a bad smell because of the sewage. Just ahead lay a sealed tomb. Hawass suspected it belonged to the governor of the settlement, sure to be the richest find on the site. In his eagerness, Hawass disregarded his own rule about waiting to enter a closed tomb and was hit with a wave of toxic powder. The powder, the yellow powder, was so strong and gives a very bad smell. And anyone who could stay five minutes inside this chamber could die. The room had been filled with hematite, a substance that can be toxic if inhaled. Hawass remained only long enough to read the name on the sarcophagus. It was indeed the tomb of the governor he'd been seeking. I did not care in that minute about the powder, about traps, or anything, and I get in until I read the name of the governor. 
That is a moment that I can't explain at all to anyone. It's a moment of something like if a man is waiting to see his child that's born for the first time and he do not know how he looks like. That exactly could be the feeling when you go inside the shop. Hematite is an ingredient in the paint used to decorate tombs. But why would the ancient Egyptians, who mined hematite and must have known its dangers, leave such a large amount in the chamber? I do not really understand why the ancient Egyptian will leave about half a feet high of hematite around the sarcophagus. Maybe they left it to stop anyone entering inside the burial chamber. The powder did delay the excavation, but Hawass suffered no long-term effects from his exposure. <laughs> then maybe, maybe it seemed like the curse of the pharaohs do not touch me, it touches others. <laughs> Ancient curses, booby traps, and poisonous gases. What other Hollywood-style hazards are waiting to put the bite on real-life archaeologists? We have the highland snakes, and we have the lowland snakes, we have rattlesnakes. Scorpions and spiders and mosquitoes, malaria-bearing mosquitoes. Fair to lance, that's the big thing here. And if it, one of those bites you, you're dead. But once you get used to it, it's not that bad. It's called ophidiophobia, from the Greek word ophid, meaning snake, and phobia, meaning fear. Ever since the first Indiana Jones movie, where the hero admitted his own ophidiophobia while at the bottom of a snake pit, these reptiles have become a staple of adventure movies and video games. But just how much of a real-life hazard are they? To Lisa Lucero, an archaeologist working at Yalbak, a Mayan excavation site near the Belize-Guatemala border, snakes are just one part of a generally perilous landscape. Everyday hazards mostly include scorpions and spiders and mosquitoes, malaria-bearing mosquitoes, and bot flies, which carry a, a parasite, a bee form, which can grow inside you, which you need to extract before it gets too large. But for Mayan archaeologists, it is the snakes that, by their sheer numbers, pose the greatest danger. When you're talking about dense forest with them all around, uh, the, the odds of getting very close to one when it's just not paying attention or isn't aware of it and then, then does defensively strike at you is, is elevated. That's a fact that American archaeologist Arthur Demarest can confirm. Demarest has spent the last six years excavating an isolated Mayan palace in the Guatemalan rainforest near Cancuen. The word Cancuen means nest of serpents in Quechi, the local Mayan dialect. It's a name that fits. There's more snakes here than any place I've ever worked. We got everything. We're at the base of the highlands, but we're in the in the jungle here, and uh, so we have the highland snakes, we have the lowland snakes, we have rattlesnakes. The Cancuen camp can be reached only by helicopter or by an arduous 48-hour trip upriver and over sometimes impassable roads. Here, smoke pots burn day and night to ward off the malaria-carrying mosquitoes. But the camp's most deadly inhabitant is the fertilance, known locally as the yellow jaw. A nocturnal pit viper related to the water moccasin, its venom is hemotoxic. It causes the victim's circulatory system to literally break down. We have lots of fair to lance. That's the big thing here. And if it, one of those bites you, you're dead. We have the antivenom, but the amount of antivenom that it would take to keep you going from a big fair to lance bite would kill you. These are very dangerous snakes in the Maya area, and they, they pack a very powerful venom. The venom attacks the nerves and the blood. It, it thins the blood. You can often have internal bleeding. As dangerous as these snakes can be, it's the isolation these archaeologists work in that's the real danger. You're working in a very remote site, even if you've got packs of anti-venom and so on, immediately available, you still need to evacuate out as quickly as you can. And of course, you're hours away from help. 
we were talking about probably eight hours before the person would get out, and that's often not enough. We've been very careful about it, mostly in terms of keeping trails very clear and relying heavily on, on the Maya uh, to lead people around. They can spot the snakes. They, can, they, they just never have any trouble with them. The women that keep the trails clear walk around barefoot. And they say it's, it's because we make too much noise. We bother the snakes. We all carry machetes and we all we have snake bite kits and we're trying to be very aware of where we are. And and you know the pitfalls of, of working in the jungle, um, the hidden, you know, holes in the ground and vines sticking out. But having antivenom is no guarantee of survival. The antivenom always says, you know, it must be stored at 25 degrees Fahrenheit or something. And yeah, right, where are you gonna do that in the middle of the rainforest? Where, where, are you, where are you going to be able to store anti-venom that's meant to be stored below freezing uh, when, it's, when it's getting well over 100 degrees every, every day in the, in the heat of the summer? If modern expeditions face such hazards, what was it like in the era before anti-venom? The answer comes from the writings of Roy Chapman Andrews, an explorer for the American Museum of Natural History in New York. In the early 1920s, Andrews set the standard for high adventure, including its dress code. Well, Roy uh, Chapman Andrews was a very flamboyant explorer. He really looked the part, and he liked to dress the part, and basically dress in the same uniform for a lot of the expedition shots and a lot of the publicity shots. He, he was, uh, uh, was sort of dashing with this uh, very neat hat, and he carried a revolver by his side. It was an image that Andrews, a small town boy from Beloit, Wisconsin, worked hard to create. An avid reader and outdoorsman, he dreamed of exploring exotic lands, an unlikely prospect in the Midwest. In 1906, at the age of 22, he moved to New York and trying to get a job at the American Museum of Natural History an institution known for its globe-trotting scientists. Andrews began working in the museum's zoological department, where he convinced his bosses that more exotic specimens were needed and that he should be the one to go and get them. Shanghai, Borneo, Korea, Japan, the Dutch East Indies. For a decade, beginning in 1910, Andrews would play the stereotypical great white hunter bagging rare trophies from every corner of the world. By the 1920s, he'd become the museum's explorer in residence. One could really see Roy Chapman Andrews as a sort of fitting, real-life model for Indiana Jones. His adventures in these exotic places, his, his marksmanship, his penchant for adventure and risk, lots of those qualities you see in the Indiana Jones characters. And like his fictional counterpart, Andrews, though a naturalist and amateur zoologist, admitted to having an instinctive loathing of snakes. Nonetheless, he understood their mystique. To meet the popular conception of an explorer, he wrote, a man must have suffered cold, heat, starvation, fever, attacks from wild animals and savage natives, and must have been bitten by snakes. Snakes are essential. If you haven't had snakes, real ones, you just can't be a proper explorer. Andrew's chance to prove himself a proper explorer occurred in the fall of 1925, in the middle of the Gobi Desert, a place where the temperature can drop 20 to 60 degrees within minutes. People may not realize, but the Gobi is a, a desert that's fairly far north. It's uh, just south of basically Siberia. And the summer is a very short season. As September comes along, you already begin to feel those Siberian winds coming down from the north. One day it could be, be extremely hot in early September, and the next day it could be snowing. It was in just such conditions that Andrew's expedition prepared for bed on that fateful night in 1925. Andrews was settling in when he suddenly spotted three brown pit vipers. Similar to the North American copperhead, 
the snakes are highly venomous. They also dislike the cold. The rapid drop in temperature drove them into the camp, seeking warmth in tents, bedding, clothing, and boots. Shouts rang out all over camp as the men reacted to a mass influx of vipers. One called out that his tent was full of snakes, hundreds of them. There was, Andrews wrote, no more sleep that night. In the course of what he later described as a very busy evening, some 47 vipers were killed. There were no human casualties, though Andrews' dog, Wolf, was bitten but recovered. Andrews had survived his real snake adventure. And as for the rest of the items on his list, cold, heat, starvation, fever, attacks from wild animals, and savage natives, the Gobi would provide all the adventure Andrews could handle, and more. It looked like something out of Lawrence of Arabia, or the first Indiana Jones movie. A line of camels laden with supplies and heavily armed riders. All around them stretched endless sand, the blazing sun, the biting desert wind. But this was the Gobi Desert, not the Sahara. And the globe-trotting hero was Roy Chapman Andrews. He was leading 25 scientists and staff on the first Central Asiatic Expedition for the American Museum of Natural History in New York. When you see these pictures from the Andrews expeditions, both the photographs and the video material, one thing that strikes you is how dramatic this whole thing is. It reminds you of an old silent film, like a D.W. Griffith film. The scale is so big, the number of extras are so great. A hundred camels, this big desert, They're extremely dramatic. I can only imagine how shocked and awestruck a, a lot of the people that lived in these regions were when they saw this caravan careening down on them from the distance. The year was 1922, and this time, Andrews was out to bag the biggest prize of his career, nothing less than the notorious missing link. During the early 1900s, there was a lot of uh, thought and theory about where humans, where the human race, where the human species evolved. In a time before human remains had been found in Africa, Several of the museum's leading scientists believed Asia was a likely origin point. There was a book that was published actually by a museum curator that proposed a theory that humans, as well as other mammals, originated from Asia. Asia was sort of the wellspring for human, the human races, the human species. Chapman focused on the Gobi, one of the most mysterious and unexplored spots on Earth accessible only by a crude trading route known as the Silk Road. It's about half a million square miles in area. That's the size of five Wyomings. It's very sparsely populated with a few little villages and uh, nomads. This area, even today, is very poorly mapped. There's a lot of places uh, to still left to explore. One can only imagine in the 1920s what a blank on the map this, this desert was. To fully explore an area of this size, Andrews would need more than camels. He came up with an unorthodox solution. Camels would carry supplies, gasoline, and oil, and stick to the Silk Road. Automobiles, the then new Dodge touring car, would do the exploring using the camels as movable gas stations. A lot of the Gobi is flat and is covered with a fine layer of pebbles. It makes for fairly easy driving, but you can be driving on the Gobi Desert for two hours, just zooming along, and then suddenly hit an impossible place to drive. Few vehicles can stand up to the extremes of the Gobi, as paleontologist Michael Novacek can attest. 60 years after the first Central Asiatic expeditions, the Mongolian government invited the American Museum of Natural History to complete the work Andrew started. Novacek, who spent the last 15 summers in the Gobi, has both followed in Andrew's footsteps and broken new ground, and a few SUVs. 
we've gone through, gosh, I don't even know how many, dozens of vehicles over the years of the expedition. And w they literally just fall apart. I remember finally abandoning a vehicle where we lifted the hood and the hood just blew off in the wind and there was hardly anything working underneath the hood. And we said, well, that's it. One of the vehicles we abandoned, uh, we actually saw the next year, we visited a nomadic family, and inside, the car seats made very nice couches inside of their, their gurs and their yurts. Breakdowns were constant. Blown tires were recycled as camel shoes to give them more traction. But this unique combination of man, machine, and camel took Andrew's party into the most unexplored regions of the Gobi. Here, the expedition was at the mercy of the desert's extreme conditions. Daytime temperatures were so hot that the party's gasoline cans sometimes exploded, and at night, temperatures dropped to barely above freezing. Sandstorms blew in from out of nowhere, blistering everything in their path. You have to react very quickly. If you're out prospecting in the field, you might have a foot race with a sandstorm to get to a sheltered place. This year, for example, we were hit by a sandstorm where we measured wind speeds of about 90 miles an hour. Andrews wrote of tents lost in the wind and sand so abrasive that it tore off his shirt, bloodied his back, and etched the windshields of the cars until the glass had to be knocked out so the drivers could see. You'll come back to a camp that's been hit by a sandstorm, and it'll be just look like a uh, look like a hurricane struck it. You know, it's just a pile of rags and broken wood and and stakes uh, all over. And sometimes you'll find tents flying out over across the desert like balloons. The desert harbored other dangers. There was crossfire from constant skirmishes between rival bands of Mongols and Chinese. Banditry was everywhere though the heavily armed expedition usually found safety in numbers. But on one occasion, while making a supply run, Andrews became separated from the rest of the caravan. On the rise of the next hill, he suddenly spotted the glint of a rifle. Mongol bandits armed with rifles were moving toward him. Knowing that any attempt to turn the motor car would leave him exposed to their fire, Andrews drew his revolver, hit the gas pedal, and charged. As the car roared down the slope at 40 miles an hour, Andrews later wrote, the horses, unused to automobiles, began bucking and rearing with fright. The bandits, hanging on for dear life, couldn't reach their weapons. When last seen, Andrews wrote, they were breaking all speed records on the other side of the valley. Weeks. Then months went by, with no sign of the human fossil remains Andrews was hunting. But then, in September of 1923, as the weather began to turn, the expedition stumbled across the find of a lifetime. That whole experience was pure serendipity and accident. They were actually lost. They were wandering around on this flat plain north of a beautiful mountain range. The cameraman from the expedition got out of one of the dodges and just started strolling around on this plane. And he walked over to the edge of this plane and looked down, and there were all these beautiful red cliffs. And it's easy to miss these cliffs unless you know exactly, you have them plotted on a map. Because if you're driving from the south, you can't see them. If you're driving from the north, you can only see them if you get over a ridge and look down the next valley. It was this isolated and hidden spot, which Andrews would later name with typical flamboyancy, the Flaming Cliffs, that would yield the greatest fossil find of this century. It was not the missing link. No trace of ancient man was ever found in the Gobi, but it would change the face of paleontology forever. Hidden in the Flaming Cliffs were nests of what appeared to be huge fossil eggs. The expedition's chief scientist, paleontologist Walter Granger, made a controversial identification. The fossil eggs, he estimated, were 80 million years old. These were actually the first nests of dinosaur eggs known to science. 
Before the expeditions to Central Asia, we didn't know anything really about dinosaur reproduction or what they did. The discovery would revolutionize paleontology. Huge fanfare, huge public interest, international press all over the world. Overnight, Roy Chapman Andrews, as well as the Central Asia Attic expeditions, were famous. Andrews would lead expeditions into Mongolia a total of five times during the 1920s. But the civil unrest and hostility to foreigners was growing. In 1926, as the expedition traveled outside Peking, a group of soldiers opened fire on their vehicles. It was the beginning of the end. Andrews was forced to cancel several planned expeditions. And by 1931, the Great Depression made such grand-scale expeditions impossible. After briefly assuming the directorship of the museum, Andrews retired to California to write his memoirs. He died in 1960, an adventurer in exile. The world Andrews had known had changed, and it was becoming a far more dangerous place. Lots of people being threatened, people being shot. Um, you realize how serious it is. For the fictional hero pursuing the prize, there is always a rival. No matter how deserted the desert or how impenetrable the jungle, someone always shows up to give them a run for the money. Indiana Jones had the Nazis. Lara Croft takes on robots, monsters, even the mafia. But the fact behind the fiction is this. Competition for artifacts between archaeologists and looters is very real. And sometimes it can turn deadly. A woman almost being beaten to death in one case, lots of people being threatened, people being shot. Um, it, you realize how serious it is. Since the days of the pharaohs, robbers have raided tombs for gold, jade, ivory, and jewels. But in today's black market, a stone artifact can be just as precious. Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization, has ranked artifacts as the third largest illicit trade in the world, after drugs and weapons and just ahead of money laundering. Even the hillsides of the Gobi, where Roy Chapman Andrews once prospected for fossils, had been pockmarked with crude pits left by looters. At auction, a dinosaur skeleton can bring millions. When the looters come in and they grab something, they get some money for it, some idiot collector in the States, and that's where the real evil is, you know. People who think that it makes them sophisticated, that they have a chunk of somebody else's heritage in their living room. And they also don't know what happens down here. In South and Central America, archaeologists like Arthur Demarest and Peter Matthews have come to terms that most of the archaeological sites they encounter have already been stripped of treasure. More than 95% of sites have been looted. And the only ones that haven't been looted are the ones that are very well protected. Uh, the, the main tourist sites like Tikal, Palenque, Copan in Honduras and so on. And even some looting goes on in those sites because they're so big and they have unprotected areas that even they can't be guarded completely. But the smaller sites that have no permanent guards at all, forget it, they're, they're just wide open to looting. Ironically, the few sites that are found undisturbed may be jeopardized just by the presence of archaeologists. Their activity alerts both organized gangs and the locals that there may be treasures to hunt. There are two kinds of looters, the opportunists and the organized. Let's face it, money talks. And when you can make a, a relatively large amount of money, that's a, a, a great incentive to loot. I mean, you can go into town and, and put the word out that you're looking for an, a jade item, and you will get several offers within the day. Some looters are simply opportunists, a local farmer or villager who happens across an artifact and sells it to the next willing tourist they meet. Many of these people are people I work with or in town or something, so I'm not gonna turn them in. If I turned in every person who offered me something, I'd have a lot of enemies. 
But there's another kind of looter who plays for higher stakes, working in gangs that are far more organized and far more dangerous. They thrive in regions where isolation, warfare, or other conflicts make patrol impossible. They use crews, tools, and four-wheel drive vehicles to remove artifacts weighing several tons. What looters very often do with monuments is they thin them, as they call it. They, they take saws to them to get rid of a lot of the, the heavier stone that isn't carved and uh, carry off the rest. These looters travel in organized crews of four to eight people. You sometimes hear them in their camp. You don't know if they're drug dealers or, or or looters, it doesn't really matter because either of them will probably shoot you if they see you, so you, you just turn around and go back. What the looters leave behind is often dangerous in its own right. At Notchtoon, an isolated spot in northern Guatemala, as much time is spent repairing the damage looters have left as on actual excavations. The biggest pyramid, actually, at Nachtun is so undermined with uh, looters' trenches um, and tunneling underneath that the entire structure is unstable. Looters dig trenches into the foundations of the temples to find offerings that might have been left during construction. In the process, the building's supports can be severed. What's left is too dangerous for archaeologists to explore. You can imagine when you've got a 30 meter high pyramid with uh, a temple on top that's about to tumble down and uh, five trenches sticking right into the sides of the pyramid. So often it, it kind of detracts hugely from the actual archaeological project just in terms of taking resources away. Uh, and yet obviously it's our obligation to do this and to uh, try and save the building from utter collapse. Most archaeologists never see the looters, only the evidence of the destruction they leave behind. There's no point trying to confront these guys. Uh, you, you, you just avoid them if you can. And obviously report them to the authorities, and generally then the army or the police go in, but by then they've often gone. Confrontations with looters are rare, but they do happen. In 2001, when a thousand-year-old carving was stolen from the archaeological site near Canquen, the people working there decided enough was enough. Canquen is a rich archaeological site, but it's also an epicenter for illegal activity. Drug running makes it a major surveillance target for the Guatemalan Drug Enforcement Administration. You'll hear the planes flying in the dark. DEA has three armor-plated night vision planes that drive them down and crash them. And sometimes they dump their stuff out of the windows before they crash. Site archaeologist Arthur Demarest managed to stay out of the conflict until an intricately carved altar was stolen from the site's royal ball court. It was a theft that outraged the native Kechi Mayas, who had been working with Demarest for almost a decade. Kekchi throughout the region understand that this is their parks, their sites, their economic future. You have these sites which can sustain through tourism the lives of thousands of people in the surrounding communities. Demarest appealed to the locals for help, hoping their sense of outrage would overcome the healthy fear they had for the smugglers. Looters take away, they're like the people who cut down the rainforest. You cut down the rainforest, you sell the wood, boom, you made some money, and it's over. And it's 400 years till it grows back. The looting is the same thing. It had to be stopped because it's destroying the heritage of these people. It's also destroying their economic future because archeological tourism is the economic future of this region. Demarest's appeal worked. Tips came in as to the whereabouts of the stolen monument and the identity of the looters. I had to bring in SIC agents, which is their FBI. It's the first time anybody's done what we did, which is to track down the looters at the source, raid the camps, arrest them, put them away. And so the reason why we were able to stop the looting 
and arrest these people is that we now have the entire population protecting these sites. The raids resulted in retaliation against the Ketchy tipsters and death threats against Demarest himself. They've been trying to kill me, um, and so I have armed men. We've had, a, we've had about three shootouts um, this, this season. I have, you know, friends in the region who have lent me some of their men of respect, uh, hombres de confianza, as they say here, who are really good, well-trained, and I know under orders from their boss, that if anything happens to me, they'll be killed, so they're very loyal. The threats against Demarest and the other witnesses only increased after the gang members were arrested and a trial date was set for June of 2004. I was the lead witness, but we had eight Kekchi witnesses. Those people, unlike me, don't have bodyguards. They risk their lives. They're real heroes. In a rare outcome for a region where arrests and prosecution of looters are almost unheard of, the thieves were found guilty. The looters, each of them got three years. But three years in a Guatemalan prison is, well, 33 doesn't make any difference. It's, uh, you've seen Midnight Express. They, they sort of model their prison system on that, I think. And uh, so it's a pretty serious penalty, and it sent a powerful message. Demarest works hard to ensure that the risks the locals took for Canquen are rewarded. Half the funds he's raised for the excavation go toward humanitarian efforts to aid the villagers who live around his site. We have uh, grants from a whole bunch of different agencies that have brought in capacitators, you know, and trained the people, helping them with sustainable agriculture and other uh, improvements in their lives that will allow them to not only survive but to thrive in the changes that will come and to keep these sites theirs and these parks theirs because they're sacred places to these people. But it's a battle that could easily have ended in disaster for Demarest and his team. More than one archaeologist has learned the hard way that to anger the indigenous people is to court danger. Were we going to get killed? Were we going to get held for ransom? Were we going to get held just for a period and then kicked out? We didn't know. The setting, an uncharted jungle, dotted with lost temples and tombs. An explorer winds his way through the thick undergrowth, oblivious to the danger that lies just ahead. It could be a scene from a Hollywood movie. But the hero is not Harrison Ford, or even Brendan Fraser. It's a Pennsylvania-born archaeologist with the unlikely name of Sylvanus Giswold Morley. The greatest living authority on Mayan archaeology, the 32-year-old Morley has just completed the first formal survey of the lost city of Huachoctun, near the border of Belize. This is Morley's fourth major Mayan expedition. He and his men know the dangers of this territory, but they're close to their base camp, and their guard is down. Coming back to what was then British Honduras from a very successful expedition in Guatemala. And almost within sight of the British Honduras border, when everyone was, was thinking of a cold beer and a warm bed and this kind of thing, they were suddenly ambushed. Morley survived only because he had dropped his glasses. He dismounted to get them and clean them off, and thus he wasn't in his accustomed position. And the expedition doctor took his place. And when firing started, the guide and the doctor were both killed. The expedition had been mistaken for revolutionaries by the local Guatemalan soldiers. They scattered into the jungle and escaped with their lives. But the incident haunted Morley for the rest of his life was the uh, nature of dropping your glasses, determining whether you live or die, that, that really bothered Morley for years, took a real act of will to go back into this environment where you never knew, literally, 
what uh, might lurk behind the nearest tree. It was a lesson Morley never forgot, and it's one that every archaeologist since has had to learn. No matter how well-intentioned, they are outsiders who may be seen as intruders or mistaken for enemies. For the rest of his career, Morley went out of his way to befriend the indigenous people he met in the jungles. A shared meal, a proffered gift, conversation over a friendly drink or two, or more. These were Morley's diplomatic tools. Morley had another advantage that kept him out of trouble. He was constantly on the move. Unlike traditional archaeologists, he did little formal excavation. He had this incredible drive, this desire to do it. He, he was called a hummingbird by, uh, by Indians who, who observed him because he was constantly buzzing around. And he lived on high all the time. His goal was not to dig up treasure, but to map the locations of all the lost cities and hidden temples of the Maya. He cleared the jungle growth, but left the artifacts and stones themselves undisturbed. To do otherwise can be dangerous, a lesson that archaeologist Peter Matthews learned the hard way. His ordeal began in 1997, during an excavation in the state of Chiapas in southern Mexico, where a prize artifact had become the subject of a local power struggle. Well, we had found an altar that was in almost pristine condition, a beautifully carved, still some paint surviving. The locals living closest to the excavation site warned the archaeologists that the monument was going to be stolen. On the black market, such a piece could fetch as much as $1 million. We'd buried this under a huge pile of stones and so on to um, try and protect it. And most of the stones had been pulled apart, and the villagers had put some of them back. But it was clear that people had got all the way down to the altar and determined it was there and might have been preparing to loot it. Matthews and his team decided to transport the stone to Frontera Corozal, a large town about 25 miles upriver where they felt the monument would be safe. But their plan would never get off the ground. We arranged for a helicopter to come in and pick up the monument, and we would go in, excavate it, crate it up carefully in, in a kind of wooden crate. At the same time, we knew this was a you know, somewhat dangerous situation that we might be getting into. As the team prepared to remove the artifact, they began to attract a restless crowd. These people that were passing through were clearly not happy, and they were, we knew they were going to relay these messages to surrounding communities. Matthews and his team, which consisted of three Mexican archaeologists and seven Cholmaya, immediately tried to pull out, but it was too late. By now, the crowd had grown to nearly 70. I think probably half of them would have said, that's fine, get lost and don't ever come back. Uh, but at the more extreme end on the other side of the spectrum were ones who clearly had more nasty designs uh, on, on the, the whole situation. And they basically held us hostage, um, kind of took all their money, took all their possessions. As night fell, the archaeologists knew something worse was about to happen. The big question was what was going to happen. Were we going to get killed? Were we going to get held for ransom? Were we going to get held just for a period and then kicked out? We didn't know. And that evening um, was a bit more ominous because some just at nightfall, some uh, men came in carrying guns. The armed men told Matthews and the others to remove their boots, then at gunpoint forced them to run into the jungle. So we raced, uh, it was pitch black at this point. We were about 50 meters from the edge of the Pusumacinta, which had a high bank. We moved very quickly down to the river. 
um, hoping that we could um, hide and get away before they changed their mind because we knew that they were very likely to come after us again. And sure enough, we got down on the kind of beach at the edge of the river and shots started ringing out all around us. And we could hear them pinging in the sand just at our feet and so on. And they, they were warning shots. I mean, they could have killed us if they wanted to, but they, they then told us all to stop and, and get it together in a group. The next moments were the worst Matthews would ever experience. I think probably the scariest part was actually when they lined us up on the edge of the riverbank. And I guess I remember thinking that the only reason really to do that was to shoot us and have our bodies kind of flop in the water and you know, we'd be found downstream. What goes through your mind at that point is it's everyone for himself, really just has to be if they start shooting, you know, do we all just stand there and wait to be shot in turn or do we all take off and maybe one or two of us would get away. Um, but that didn't happen because they didn't start shooting, thank God. Instead, the armed men began to beat the excavation team with the butts of their rifles. I got a rifle butt in the face and a broken nose and the next thing I noticed was I'm, I'm on the ground and I remember thinking, my God, you know, it just knocked me clear off my feet. Afterwards, the armed men withdrew back into the jungle. The excavation team was alone. But their attackers could return at any time. They decided to split up. Six of the locals would head for the nearest town and try to get help. The rest would make for the Guatemalan border. These other guys were, were Indians like the local communities and could probably slip down the paths relatively unnoticed, but we were going to stick out like sore thumbs. So we decided that we'd go across the river try and get across the river and hide out on the Guatemalan side. And at this stage, it was the very end of the dry season, but it hadn't started raining at all. And so the river was very low and very calm, which was a factor in our getting out. By chance, Matthews and his party found a makeshift boat and were able to make their escape. Crossing the river, they remained in hiding in the Guatemalan jungle for two more days barefoot, bleeding, and without any supplies. And I think all of us were getting weaker and so on. And so um, we were debating what to do. Then came a welcome sight, a supply boat, bound for another archaeological dig downstream. When the boat picked us up, we knew we were safe from the immediate problems. We were very lucky, really, with the, the way the timing of this all worked. Overhead, there were already planes searching for them. The rest of their party had gotten through and raised the alarm. All 11 survived and eventually recovered. The altar that had become the subject of such contention was taken by their attackers to another village, but it did not end up on the black market. It was set up in a little shrine in their community, and that's where it still is. It is an object of beauty and of value, uh, and they didn't want it taken out of their community, which was certainly a valid point. Matthews was lucky to be alive. In such isolated landscapes, even small conflicts like these can be deadly. But what happens in these ancient backwaters when battles are waged on a global scale? In World War I and World War II, Archaeological sites would become backdrops for both open warfare and covert action. And just like in the movies, it would be the archaeologists themselves in the line of fire. In Hollywood movies, the archaeologist heroes can be loners. They may be mercenaries, cynics, and rogues, but underneath the roughest exterior beats a patriotic heart. When duty calls, when democracy hangs in the balance, they're expected to drop their brushes and trowels and go for their guns. Such partisans exist in real life, but often their identities are kept secret for years. Even today, it's dangerous for archaeologists who work on foreign soil to be anything but neutral. In 1917, just weeks before America formally entered World War I, one such patriot walked into the Cosmos Club, an elite Washington, D.C. watering hole that catered to scientists, academics, and government power brokers. 
The man was 32-year-old Sylvanus Morley, explorer, archaeologist, Mayan scholar, and, as it would later be learned in documents declassified some 70 years later, American spy. Morley approached an Office of Naval Intelligence uh, senior person and offered his services and offered to recruit other archaeologists who operated in Mexico and Central America who would be willing to be American spies. At the time, Morley was exploring Mayan sites at the behest of the Carnegie Institution in Washington. He was considered the world's leading expert on Mayan hieroglyphics. Over the course of his long and distinguished career, Morley located dozens of lost ruins, documented them, deciphered the hieroglyphics, and named the ancient settlements. Huashaktun, Nachtun, Tikal, Chichen Itza, Yashilan. No archaeologist before or since would have his name associated with so many major Mayan sites or personally explored so sweeping a territory. A charming, hard-drinking womanizer in the best Hollywood tradition, Morley was known to charm even the irate husbands of his conquests over a dwindling bottle of tequila. He had the incalculable ability to ingratiate himself from a mule skinner of the president of a country. He could win their friendship, win their cooperation. He used that skill to gather information, both from locals he met in the jungle and the expatriates who frequented the cabanas of Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. Morley always knew what the local rebel forces were planning, which government officials were corrupt, and if a rumor of a lost temple might actually pan out. When he offered his services to the Office of Naval Intelligence, he did so as an individual who spoke serviceable Spanish, who knew the region, who knew all the influential people who were there. Now, one of the things Morley was hearing from his contacts was increasing talk of German interest in Central America. Morley, who had hated the Germans since their invasion of Belgium in 1914, couldn't stand the idea of Germans encroaching on what he considered his personal turf. Morley's dislike, or hatred actually, of Germans stemmed uh, in part from World War I patriotism, but also from the fact that his mother was Belgian, and the whole matter of German atrocities in Belgium, etc. And whenever Morley saw a German, he, um, he went ballistic. Morley wasn't the only one concerned about the increasing German presence south of the border. In 1916, just before the American entry into the war, the, the Germans on three occasions sent submarines into American waters, touching at Baltimore and at Rhode Island. They wanted to demonstrate to the United States Navy that they had the capability to sail from German ports all the way across the Atlantic to the United States coast. Mexico? and Central America, though officially neutral during World War I, seemed poised to become German outposts. The United States had been involved in two major invasions of Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, and both um, most of the Latin American states were anti-American. What worried Washington was that the Germans would be able to capitalize on all this anti-American feeling and establish either secret bases or at least supply points on the coast to supply German submarines. And this terrified the uh, U.S. Navy. Not only could they torpedo everything coming through the Panama Canal, but they could dominate the Atlantic and keep the American expeditionary force from even getting to France. And World War I would have ended somewhat different it seemed clear that the U.S. needed to keep an eye on German movements in Mexico and Central America. But at the time, the American military had few options. U.S. intelligence generally, and U.S. naval intelligence in particular, uh, was kind of a backwater. Spying was still viewed by the U.S. Navy, among others, as an occupation in which gentlemen did not uh, participate. And as a result, when the declaration of war came in April of 1917, they had to start from the beginning. And 
Morley's offer was a real godsend. In fewer than three weeks, Morley was back in British Honduras, but this time as an official operative for the Office of Naval Intelligence, secret agent number 53. And already he had his hands full. Or as soon as the United States entered the war, all the German agents operating in this country went to Mexico, where they operated very freely with the uh, tacit support of the Mexican government. Morley's first task was to investigate the veracity of coded German radio dispatches that the Allies had intercepted. And these reports directed these German spies in Mexico to set up supply bases to supply German submarines operating either in the Gulf of Mexico or along the Central American coast. But was such an audacious plan really possible? Morley would find out firsthand. Traveling by boat and on horseback, he spent the next year surveying and mapping the coastline from Nicaragua to Veracruz. These sites were possible locations for German submarine bases or resupply points, and Morley's going to cover them, literally foot by foot, sailing into the mouths of rivers, Along the way, he continually updated his map of archaeological sites, adding a number of new discoveries. It was natural cover for him to do this. He could have the Office of Naval Intelligence pay him to sit there and to look at Mayan sites while he's looking over his shoulder for German submarine bases. On more than one occasion, local officials became suspicious of his movements. But Morley had credentials from the Carnegie Institute, as well as letters of recommendation from a variety of powerful territorial leaders who had been courted over long, rum-soaked evenings. When he was confronted and accused of being a spy, he would say, I'm not a spy, I'm a distinguished archeologist, which he was. And besides, I have a letter from your president even with such advantages, Morley's mission was not without hazard. Their supplies frequently ran out and they had to live off the land by eating wherever they could find somebody who would uh, sell them food. And then uh, there were things such as snakes, coral snakes, biting pests, uh, ticks, fleas, and then a whole variety of uh, tropical diseases, uh, malaria, dysentery, cholera, typhoid. Morley once contracted a very serious case of uh, skin disease from some bacteria from the water. In the course of his mission, his boat would be damaged by violent tropical storms, at one point stranding him on a Caribbean island for 18 days before a passing freighter provided rescue. But after conducting a detailed survey of 2,000 miles of coastline, Morley was able to determine, even before the Germans did, that their submarine plan was not feasible. What Morley accomplished was basically negative intelligence. He was able to lay the Navy's fears to rest, that certain areas that on a map looked as though they were quite suited to um, submarine activity weren't because the water was three feet deep, this kind of thing. His assignment completed, Morley returned to his archaeological pursuits, leading expeditions to the sites he had documented and spending the next 17 years supervising the reconstruction of Chichen Itza, now the world's most visited Mayan site. He died in 1948, at the age of 65, his heart weakened by the bouts of malaria that had plagued him in the Mayan jungles. Morley had also shown the American military just how useful civilians, especially academic or scientific insiders, could be on foreign soil. In World War II, archaeologists, academics, and other scholars would be recruited for covert services in record numbers. Their contributions would be secret, but the danger would be as great as those on the front lines. 
They either shot him where he lay, which is one account, or took him outside, propped him up against the wall, and shot him. Indiana Jones may be the most famous archaeologist to ever take on the Nazis, but he's not the only one. One of the most deadly real-life encounters began in May 1941, when Nazi paratroopers descended on the island of Crete. They were expecting an easy victory. They'd been assured that there would be no resistance and that um, the Cretans would welcome them with open arms. As the paratroopers fell, they saw the Cretans running toward them. But instead of bearing gifts, they carried farm implements, knives, and shotguns. They would use anything that they could get hold of. The Cretans would set fire to fields of, of crops to, to flush out the Germans. They would, they would shoot them as they were coming down before they even landed. Um, they would do anything, basically, to, to kill them. The Nazis would come to blame one man for the unexpected slaughter, a one-eyed, adventure-loving archaeologist named John Stringfellow Pendlebury. Born in 1904, the only son of a London surgeon, Pendlebury was an energetic, even hyperactive child. About the age of two, he lost one of his eyes by sticking a pencil in it, and it went septic. But it never stopped him doing sports and things like that. By the time he reached college and his full height of six feet, he was a champion runner and high jumper. Physical prowess was a very big thing for him, possibly more so because he'd lost an eye and it was the sort of thing that he would normally not be expected to do as well as the other kids. And he drove himself the harder for it. Pendlebury applied the same drive to the study of archaeology becoming an expert on Bronze Age artifacts by the time he was in his early 20s. He did field work in both Egypt and Greece, where his boundless energy and swift mastery of the local languages brought equally rapid advancement. By the age of 26, he was splitting his time between two prestigious positions. Curator of both Tel El Amarna, the Egyptian city founded by Nefertiti, and Gnosis, the spectacular Bronze Age capital of Crete. Pendlebury would find tombs and treasure at both sites, but he remained restless. He began hiking the inhospitable mountains of Crete, following ancient pathways for miles and finding new archaeological sites thousands of feet above sea level. Well, he found about 100 in one season. Um, it's difficult to say exactly how many he found it. And he would follow tracks between centers of, of prominence and find sites along the way. Pendlebury soon became a familiar figure to the local shepherds and farmers, wearing an eye patch and carrying an unusual walking stick. It was known as a sword stick. If you twisted the end, a little sword would come out. But he just wanted to get the right piratical look. Um, and the sword stick was very much part of that. And most Cretans particularly liked eccentrics like Pendlebury, who would walk across the whole mountain range um, with his um, eye patch or glass eye or whatever, um, speaking pretty good Greek. They admired that sort of Englishman. Over the next few years, Pendlebury's attachment to the island grew. He spent hours with the clan leaders, the village capitans, listening to their tales of fighting the Turks. There was always up until that point, a distance between the, the foreign archaeologists and the workmen or the locals. And that never existed with, with Pendlebury. He was much more one of them. But when Britain entered the war in 1939, Pendlebury was eager to do his part, if only the British War Office would let him. He was already 34, 35 by this stage. So he was very, very near the limit of, of active service. And the fact that he only had one eye meant that he had to fight very hard to get them to do anything with him. In 1940, when the Italians invaded Athens, all that changed. Pendlebury was called home for training and given a captain's commission with Britain's covert special operations. He was appointed as British Vice Consul in Crete um, to Heraklion. And, and basically, that was a cover 
He went back to Crete to organize resistance groups, but without the knowledge of the Greek government. Pendlebury began organizing the Capitans he knew so well to once again defend their land. He knew that if anybody ever invaded the island, that they would fight to the last man and to the last woman and child, uh, you know, just to, to keep free from occupation again. They could be pretty brutal if they wanted to be. They had their own particular clique or clan or whatever. Uh, the way they'd fought, fought the Turks for centuries, um, the absolute sort of suicidal bravery. When the Germans began planning Operation Mercury, the massive airborne assault on the island, the Allied codebreakers had already intercepted many of the details. But the Nazis had no idea what was waiting for them. They were told at one stage that there were only about 5,000 British troops on the island. Uh, the true figure was, in fact, nearly 10 times that. Uh, many of them, of course, weren't properly armed or trained, but um, even so, they were fa facing a considerable force which they hadn't uh, imagined at all. The paratroopers who landed near Heraklion took the heaviest fire. Now, the British troops had been told that they were coming down faster than they realized, and they were told to aim for the boots, because if you aim for the boots, you'd probably get him in the stomach. With the volume of fire that was being put up, uh, they killed over 2,000 in the very first day, uh, which was a, an astonishing setback for the Germans. In fact, it was their biggest setback so far in the war. That battalion was, was massacred completely. The Crete resistance fighters, though poorly armed, dispatched any stragglers they found. One witness likened it to a medieval siege, saying that only the boiling oil was missing. The Cretans, on the other hand, waited particularly until the paratroopers, they landed in olive trees or got caught up, snagged up in wires or whatever it might be, and then they would kill them uh, using whatever means they had, whether it was bread knives or whatever. Pendlebury himself joined the fray near Heraklion, fewer than three miles from his archaeological site at Gnosis. He was involved in some of the street fighting around the harbor at Heraklion and was then over at the Hanya Gate, which is on the west side of town. Pendlebury got a, a chest shot and was very, very badly injured, couldn't really stand, so was carried off by these German soldiers to a nearby house. What happened next is unclear. But at some point, the Germans decided Pendlebury did not warrant medical treatment. They either shot him where he lay, which is one account, or took him outside, propped him up against the wall, and shot him. They may not have known whom they had executed. But when his papers were later discovered, it was Pendlebury the Nazis blamed for their losses on the island. I don't think the Germans had a very clear idea of exactly what Pendlebury was up to. I mean, they, they had their suspicions, um, and they discovered enough papers to give them a pretty clear idea afterwards. But they certainly had no idea in advance. First, they found plenty to suggest that he'd been um, rather active in that area. And so they began to put out a lot of propaganda saying that the only reason the Cretans had fought so fur furiously was because Pendlebury had sort of roused their spirits and told them all sorts of lies about German people and things like that. Which, of course, it's nonsense. For weeks afterward, rumors flew that the resistance leader was still alive. There were a lot of rumors of a, of a man with one glass eye still wandering around on the mountains. They'd had this special SS unit looking into him, and they were very impressed with what he'd managed to achieve, but they were also determined to catch him. He became a bit of a, of a prize. The rumors led to a gruesome search. And they'd had every grave between Knossos and Heraklion um, dug up, and they had people, children, you know, sort of teenagers and things, go around in work groups and try and de decide whether the bodies had a glass eye by sticking their fingers in. The, the rumors say that 
uh, that Hitler couldn't sleep until he had um, Pendlebury's glass eye on his bedside table, but whether that's true, I you know, don't know. A month into the occupation, the Germans found Pendlebury's body near the house where he'd been killed. His remains were buried by Kania Gate. There, local villagers raised a wooden cross. On it was an epitaph worthy of any action hero. John Pendlebury, he fell fighting. Though the Nazis eventually took the island, the victory came at a terrible price. In the course of the battle, the Germans lost nearly uh, 4,000 killed um, and nearly another 3,000 wounded and missing. The irony of the whole battle, though, is that Hitler immediately saw it as, if you like, a defeat almost, and de was determined never to use paratroops again. For the remainder of the war, the Germans would have to maintain a force of 15,000 troops on the island. The resistance did play a part, if you like, of tying down German troops, at least a division or more, um, throughout the war. So from that point of view, you know, the Cretan resistance certainly uh, proved its worth. But it wasn't just soldiers who would occupy what Pendlebury had called his island. The Nazi SS brought in their own archaeologists, members of the elite Ananerva, to sift through the Greek archaeological sites. But what could they have been searching for? There are all sorts of stories um, that link both the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail with some strange power. In the B-movies and serials of the 1940s, Nazis had a habit of turning up everywhere. A lost temple deep in the jungle, an underwater city, a desert caravan. That theme was updated in the 1980s, so the Nazis could give Indiana Jones a run for his money. But it was more than a mere plot device that had Nazis hunting for the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail. In reality, no military force has ever been more deeply involved with the quest for ancient artifacts. There is no other example in the world of a regime that took over uh, the practice of archaeology, uh, sponsored it so much as the Third Reich. There was a huge amount of archaeology sponsored by Heinrich Himmler's SS. Himmler himself was fascinated by archaeology and sponsored many digs, especially in Germany, hundreds of them. The excavations took place under the auspices of an academic arm of the SS called Das Ananerva. It means ancestral heritage. It, was, it had 53 departments. It, it, it ended up being absolutely immense. Most of the archaeologists who worked for the SS or were sponsored by the SS were legitimate archaeologists with university positions. It was an organization that gave grants for doing things like archaeology. And it's, I suppose it was very difficult for them to turn that down. But the archaeology Himmler had in mind went far beyond the canons of science. Sometimes he would call it Atlantis. Sometimes it would not have a name, but nevertheless, he believed that long ago there was this immensely powerful civilization that from which Germans had descended. One of the things he wanted to do was to do that historically, was to find a way back to this master civilization that had been the height of Aryan power long ago in the past. Archaeology was one way he wanted to do that. There were also rumors that the Nazis were looking for specific, sacred relics. There are all sorts of stories that link the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail with some kind of unexplained power. There are stories in the Bible about the Ark of the Covenant crushing the enemies of Israel and so on. I'm sure this is absolute nonsense, but what they do confer on anyone who can associate themselves with the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail is symbolic power. And symbols were very important to the Nazis. The search for ancient symbols and proof of an Aryan past accelerated with the start of the war. When the uh, Germans occupied Greece, for example, 
uh, there were archaeological um, excavations sponsored by the Nazis in Greece to try and trace Greek civilization back to the Aryans. In 1939, as Hitler's army invaded Poland, a Nazi expedition was on its way to the Far East. One of the most striking things about the first Indiana Jones film is that the Nazis appear when Indiana Jones goes to Nepal. And I think this connection between the Nazis and Central Asia is to do with the fact that the SS sponsored an expedition to Tibet at the end of the 1930s. They wanted to find the human traces in Asia of this collapsed empire. Himmler had grand plans to house the ancient artifacts he hoped to find. He took over a castle in uh, the middle of Germany called Wevelsberg, and he also had a museum there. And he exhibited what his archaeologists had found. However modest they were, just a small piece of pottery, they were all exhibited. You can bet if Himmler found the Holy Grail or the Spear of Destiny or any of these completely mythological objects, they would have become prize exhibits. But no such relics were ever found, at least not in time to save Berlin from the combined power of the Allies, or Himmler from his self-administered cyanide pills. The twisted archaeology of the Nazis died with him. He was looking for something that doesn't exist. There is no Atlantis. There was no Aryan master civilization. He was chasing a phantom. Their unholy quest would be relegated to the realm of fantasy. And even here, they would be repeatedly foiled by fictional heroes like Indiana Jones. And it would be this image, the archaeologist as hero, that would prove immortal, even if reality rarely measures up to it. Real archaeologists would meticulously, you know, take out every stone and every layer before they got to that. It would take them months and months versus walking in, grabbing it, and running and being chased by a large stone ball. And in fact, a lot of it's just mundane routine. You know, day after day, you get up, you, you, you work. Well, what I, I, when I do my intro to archaeology class, I show the first 10 minutes of Indiana Jones, and I said, this is what archaeology is not. I'm not like Indiana Jones because he did not know anything about excavations. I don't like riding horses, for example, and I'm not so afraid of snakes as he is. People just assume you're having one adventure after another. And of course, when something else happens, uh, you, you, you get attacked by a bandit or your vehicle rolls over on a rough bush trail or, or some other drama occurs like that. Um, those are the events that people remember. You don't go looking for those kinds of adventures. As for the characters in the Indiana Jones films, Heinrich Himmler wasn't the only inspiration for the tomb-hunting Nazis. Otto Rahn was an archaeologist and SS officer who was obsessed with finding the Holy Grail. He was convinced it was located in the Cathar fortress of Mont Segur in southern France. But he froze to death on a mountaintop at the age of 35 without ever finding it. From the ancient city of Petra, I'm Josh Bernstein. Thanks for joining me. Be sure to check out season two of my adventure archaeology series, Digging for the Truth, right here on the History Channel.